This weekend, the Blancpain GT World Challenge Europe kicks off at Brands Hatch. It's a fantastic old school British circuit and it always delivers great action for the GT3 field. Two races for the GT3 cars, mandatory pit stops and driver changes and two very jumbled grids after qualifying yesterday. This opening round of the Blancpain GT World Challenge Europe is part of a global series. There's the GT World Challenge running in America and in Asia as well. We've had two races in the States, one in Asia and the European leg kicks off this weekend. Two great motorsport brands, Mercedes and Ferrari, go head to head in the Blancpain GT World Challenge and some star drivers are across the ranks as well. The likes of Rafael Di Marchiello heading up Mercedes and you've got Andrea Bertolini, former FIA GT1 world champion representing Ferrari. It's a stellar cast for Ferrari in America as well, headed by Tony Villander. In Europe, there's Andrea Bertolini, David Perel, Renat Salikov and Louis Machiels from across the Pro-Am and the Am Cups. And over in Asia, the Australian driver David Russell stands out as a man to watch. So across the three continents, a very impressive driver lineup, and Ferrari is looking strong. But so too is Mercedes. For example, in America, the British driver Ryan Diel is one of the point scorers. In Europe, there's Raphael Marchiello, Lucas Stoltz, Thomas Neubauer and Jean-Luc Bobelli, all very quick across the classes. And in Asia, the likes of Rulof Bruins, for example, and Jeffrey Lee will be scoring good points too. So Mercedes, the equal of Ferrari. A fascinating battle is in prospect. And after three races so far, two in America and one in Asia, it is Mercedes ahead on points. So let's have a look at the entry for the Blancpain GT World Challenge Europe for 2019. In terms of numbers on the grid, Audi is the strongest. And one of the star drivers is Dries Van Thor, who went well here last year. Last year went quite well. Uh, we had a win and fortunate DNF. So let's try to, to make it two wins this year. Uh, it will be tough because it's a, it's a very hard uh, field. But yeah, I think we're prepared. Uh, we had a decent weekend in, Mo in Monza. So let's try, let's try to do a better job here again. A mainstay of the Blancpain GT Series has been Stefan Ortelli. He was in right from the beginning, but he did miss the opening Endurance Cup race at Monza. However, for these sprint races, these one-hour races, he's back on the entry list for Santalon. Blancpain GT Series is the, the place to be, and I'm so delighted that uh, I get a, a late uh, phone call from uh, Safe Satellite from Santalon, driving an Audi, which obviously uh, it's uh, one of the strongest cars here in the, in the field. But I also know the guys, you know, Christopher Az and Winkelog used to be my teammate in the old time and uh, I have a new teammate and I'm going to try to do my best to help him uh, with my uh, uh, knowledge of the, the championship. A great British brand is Aston Martin and the R Motorsport squad has a brace of cars here at Brands Hatch. Ricky Collard moves from BMW to Aston Martin, carving a very nice career for himself as a GT driver. And Ricky is eager to do well on home soil. So like you say, the characteristics of this circuit are quite narrow, quite undulating, quite bumpy. Um, you know, it's going to be really difficult. Um, you know, hopefully the home advantage for me will work quite well, especially with a British car and a British circuit. Maybe that might have an influence as well, but um, no, we should be in for a really good battle. And uh, yeah, I've got a lot of supporters coming this weekend and uh, hopefully they can get behind me and push me. Reigning champion Rafael Marchiello is very much the benchmark Mercedes-Benz driver. And the Italian, who always goes well around Brands Hatch, could well be on for a win here. No, it's a really nice track. It's like an old-style track with no like runoff area. It's a, a small nourish life, let's say. So I like the track where if you do mistake, you're into wall. So this one is one of the track like this, so it's nice. It's really difficult to overtake the other car, so if you have a good start, you have a good result uh, during the race, if you, if you have a clean pit stop, so we have to try to, to start as much as the front as possible, then we can start to score some nice points for the championship. Last year's Silver Cup champion was the German driver Nico Bastia. He stays Mercedes mounted for Acker ASP, but now he's got a new co-driver. Thomas Neubauer will drive with him in 2019, but they should still be good for strong results. As the uh, champion from last year, for sure, I want to keep the trophy uh, in my hands. I want to have it uh, at home and I want to give it away. And uh, Thomas, for sure, is the right teammate for that uh, because I think he's competitive, like I said. And um, yeah, it's all about the Silver Cup for us, for sure. But also, I think this year uh, we can also have some surprises, maybe in overall classification sometimes. 
Lamborghini has a very strong lineup as well. In the Pro Am car number 519 is the British driver Phil Keane, a Lamborghini factory driver, and he undoubtedly is going to star a potential class winner. Our aim is obviously, you know, we want to do as well as we can to win, obviously, uh, the Pro Am, the, the Pro Am class, and to be as far up in the in the Pro class as we can. And Hiroshi's, you know, he's a quick a quick bronze and a good learner, so you know we'll set our sights high and uh, and see how we get on. The grid is formed and our first one-hour race set to get underway. And the Brands Hatch Grand Prix circuit is always a great place to be for GT racing. Uh, David Addison and John Watson trackside as we look forward to the first race. And it's Lucas Stoltz with the blue Mercedes that starts on pole position with Mirko Bortolotti's repaired Lamborghini alongside. Nico Bastian will start in the blue Mercedes from Aka ASP on row two of the grid and Andrea Caldarelli's Lamborghini on the outside of row two. Go back to the third row of the grid, and that is where you get to the first of the Audis. Not from WRT, this car, but the Attempto racing team. Calvin van der Linde will start in the car that he shares with Clement Schmidt. And Vincent Abril in the Aka ASP team Mercedes comes next. There it is, the blue and white car that he shares with Raphael in Marciello. On row four of the grid is the next of the Attempto Audis. Stein Scott Horst goes first, and the best placed WRT Audi is alongside in the hands of Ezequiel Perez Compact, switching from Lamborghini to Audi for this year. Row five, it is Ricky Collard for our motorsport in the Aston Martin, and alongside him, Simon Gachet's Santalock Audi. Go back a row, the Australian driver, Shea Davis, racing here for the first time and sharing with uh, GT newcomer, Tom Gamble. Uh, alongside is the second of the our motorsport, Aston Martins, that's Airo Vigno, going first aboard 62. On the seventh row, number 10, Oscar Tunico, who was off through the gravel a couple of times yesterday, and alongside him is Timur Bogatlaski's Mercedes, both in the Silver Cup. Go back a row, Charles Viet, in his first full season of GT racing, lining up for WRT alongside the Phoenix Audi in the hands, to begin with, of Kim Louis Schramm. Then, also for Phoenix, the blue Audi, Finley Hutchison, and alongside him, GT4 graduate Stephen Pallet for Santalock. On the next row of the grid, another of the Attempto Audis. This one is pedalled in the first stint by Milan Doccia, and alongside him is the Pro-Am Cup Ferrari that Louis Machiels will share with Andrea Bertolini. Uh, more Pro-Am cars next. You've got the Rinaldi Ferrari of Renat Salikov sharing with David Perel, and Phil Keane's car, but uh, Hiroshi Hamaguchi will go first in that car. Next on the grid, Jean-Luc Bobelic, and alongside is Wolfgang Triller, Pro-Am and Am Cup, respectively. And at the back of the grid, Diego Menchaca. Now, we were talking about the Lamborghini of Mirko Bortolotti having been rebuilt. This car was upside down in the gravel at Paddock yesterday. This is another one that's had a lot of work overnight. Who is going to make the best start? Will it be the Grunt and Go Mercedes or the aero friendly Lamborghini that will make the run in towards Paddock Hill Bend? We are about to find out as we are set to go racing. Round one of North Pound GT World Challenge Europe from Brands Hatch. Ready to get underway. The cars accelerate out of Clark Kell. The lights will change. The race is on. And a good start by Stoltz as up the inside tries to go Nico Bastian as well. Bortolotti on the outside line. They dive into Paddock. He can't grab the race lead. He just hangs on the second. Can he cut across and go for the inside? There's drama off the road. Four cars. Kim Louis Schramm is in the gravel. There on the inside line, there's a Mercedes that's come to grief. We're going to get the safety car inevitably, I'm afraid, with two cars in the gravel trap. But Kim Louis Schramm is off the road. There's another car involved as well, as on track, and briefly off it, Luca Stolz leads. Second, it is Portolotti. But I'm waiting for the balls to come and the yellow flags to fly because we've had drama right at the very start and the safety car is being deployed. The safety car is being deployed as the cars go onto the Grand Prix loop. Well, there was all first four cars into the paddock and then clean and clear. There you see what's happened, 55 ID. And um, oh, there were four other cars, three other cars that also, some are in that gravel on the outside of Paddock Bend. Some of them may have managed to drive their way through, but two of them there are completely beached. At the front, everything is fine, but look back to the middle, probably four or five rows back. Something here is about to go dramatically wrong. It's this area now on the run up into Paddock. Everything is under control. Turn in, everybody is fine. All of a sudden, out of that camera side, you'll get yeah. quite what actually occurred. Timo Bogoslavski in the pale blue and white Mercedes in midfield was involved in it somewhere along the line. So they turn into the corner, and Kim Louis Schramm. Oh, he's yes, yes, yes. It happened. Yeah, so Scott Horse gets it wrong. Others take evasive action. Yeah. This is looking from Nico Bastian's car. So he should be ahead of all the mayhem. He nearly got past Bortolotti, didn't he? He did, but Bortolotti really closed the door aggressively just to make sure that the Mercedes Bastian wasn't going to take that second place away. And again, 
Bordel Lotti looking one way than the other, trying to put pressure onto the back of Lucas Storms and the Mercedes, but just has to be patient. The safety car is in at the end of this lap. Zerko Bortolotti needs, and he knows this, to be on his toes because he's got one golden chance at jumping Lucas Storms. It didn't quite happen at the start of the race. Can he do it on the restart of the race? Otherwise, that Mercedes will build a gap. So down they come then, and it is Lucas Storms that will lead them away on this restart. Everybody now starting to bunch up once again. It's Stolz that will control the pace as the cars accelerate away. So Lucas Stolz has gone, a good restart. That to jump ahead of Bortolotti. Bastian is third, but Mirko Bortolotti losing out. As there, look, over the timing line. Collard versus Avril for seventh place. Vincent Avril lines him up beautifully on the inside line. The gap is there, through he goes. Vincent Avril gains a place. New to Mercedes this year, but Ricky Collard fights back as they make the climb up towards Druids gets a face full of the back of the Mercedes, but Stolz for Black Falcon it is that leads the race. Yeah, Ricky Conrad sort of opened the door up to let the Mercedes come through, then he decided to come back as best he could up at the, up at the Druids, didn't quite get the job done. But the number 88 Mercedes, that's on a real, clearly we know that car's a quick car. The Aston certainly showed good reaction in terms of coming back. So onto the Grand Prix loop they go. This is lap six. And the battle is on because Collard now is under increasing pressure from the Audi of Oscar Tunico then, the Colombian driver right there behind him as they turn into the right-hander of Hawthorns. And as the cars accelerate now in through the right of Westfield, Andrea Caldarelli running at the moment in uh, fifth place. Let's see what progress can come from that. So we've got the cars into sheet curve, then on towards Sterling's turn left, green flags fly, but Stoltz is building this lead. Yeah, in the meantime, You've got Vincent Abril all over the back of Shea Davis and the idea he'll want to clear the idea as quickly as possible. That's the gap that's built up. So the 88 needs to make progress, Shea Davis, doing what he has to do, just driving his own race. Ricky Collard lining up and you're now going to get a group of maybe four or five cars all lining up behind. What is the sixth place idea of Shea Davis? There is a stop-go penalty for Andrea Caldarelli for causing the collision at Turn 1. Andrea Caldarelli is being given a one-minute stop-go penalty for wow. causing the collision at Turn 1, John. Well, I wonder, was that an on-board camera in Caldarelli's car that might have picked up that incident? Interesting, isn't it? So that is going to go down like a broken lift, as far as Caldarelli is concerned. He is not going to take kindly to that. He'll want to come and get the 60-second, that's the best part of a lap, penalty out of the way as quickly as comes into Clark Curve. Does he go for the pit lane now? No. We haven't heard him shout, no, over the engine, though, but he will not be pleased at all, really. I don't know how soon he will have had the notification, whether it's done by radio or whether it'll be a visual and radio. And what sometimes happens, we've seen it in the past, is the team manager will go immediately up to the race director and or the stewards and say, you know, we want to argue this before we actually take the penalty. Team manager is Calderelli, isn't he? Of course, he's in the so car. Somewhat difficult, actually. Yeah, you can't do the arguing, you're quite right. So, Calderelli has this Damocletian stop go. Stolz leads Bortolotti, and Bortolotti has done the fastest lap of the race. It's game on! Mercedes leads Lamborghini onto the Grand Prix loop. Stolz is being caught by the Italian. Catch, but overtake. Always, always the difficulty here at Brands Hatch. Wherever you are, you can catch. You can be a second a lap quicker than the lead car, whichever car that might be. But where do you find a way past? Calderelli's dander is up, as they say. He's just done the absolute best in the first sector. So he might not be able to win the race, but he's a very angry Italian, that's for sure, as the car's now blast up towards Sheen Curve. Yeah, his focus clearly is on what he's doing behind the wheel, not necessarily what is being communicated from the pit lane, but two drivers lower down making progress. Compound is back up to 18th, Menchaka from the back of the grid after rolling in qualifying, so he started 25th, he is up into 16th place. And of course, Calderelli is gonna lose places when he serves that uh, stop go. Now let's have another look, if we can, at exactly what did happen. So look at the, out, the Lamborghini on the outside there, cutting across. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. No, no, that was... <laughs> He, he came across the idea, there's no question about it. What's the Audi supposed to do? It's, it is already halfway along the door. It's a left-hand drive car. I don't know what the car, I'm not trying to defend what Calderelli did, mm. because there was contact, and the penalty has been, there it is, he's making the pit lane entrance to serve that penalty out. There was no malice, in my opinion, in, in that contact, but the outcome of it is the penalty has been uh, awarded to Calderelli, and he's going to sit there for one minute, but it's been interminable length of time. Yeah. So a, a decent result out of this is now effectively gone. Safety car might bring them back into the mix, but the engineers talk to Andrea Calderelli, the man behind the wheel. 
the rest of the field comes pouring through, and that's going to drop him to effectively last place now. And there, mowing the lawn, effectively coming out of Sterling's. That was Finley Hutchison in the Phoenix Audi, bringing all the muck onto the road. Now there, look, back into the race goes Cal Rally, but that's cost him a lap. Yes, he's been feeding back in just to the turn end of the top five cars. He can run now at whatever pace he can run at. I mean, he can run probably quicker than some of the cars immediately ahead of him, but he's now a lap down, and his race is in effect a, a done deal. He's sort of joined in where he was, but a lap down. So here you've got, looking back from Louis Machiel's Ferrari, and he leads Pro-Am. The opposition is there, the green Ferrari of Renat Salikov as Milan Doncha tries to get up the inside. Ferrari goes wide. Audi tries to get the round down the hill as he gone by. Machiel's real target here is to keep that green Ferrari behind him because that's for the class lead. Yeah, they already got cleanly through, so now the battle for the particular class. And light flashing, there's that a light. I'm not quite sure that was anything other than you really... You know what me off by doing that. You've, you've thrown me back into the arms of the, the competitor I wanted to be ahead of. So Portolotti, fastest lap of the race, chasing Stoltz. Here, Salikov chasing after Louis Machiels. And they are nominated Ferrari point-scoring drivers within the Brompan GT World Challenge, part of that European four-nominated driver lineup. There is Salikov, and he's closed right up in the Rinaldi run. Ferrari onto the tail of the AF Corsa entry as they climb the hill now. So it's all, I suppose, what we'd imagine there would be at Brands. Equal distance between car and car, car, car. Oh, and that's Louis, 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 Louis. What have you done? Oh. You put that right rear onto the grass. You lost the back of the car. You then overcorrected and it's gone into the tire barrier. He's managed to keep the momentum going. Oh, but has gradually, oh, has gradually, it? that's it. Now, was that pressure or just a fundamental error? I would say it was a bit of both. A bit of both. I think you might be right. And it's going to be a safety car. I would have thought to get him out of the way. Calder rally back in and out of the car. And but there's no point running anymore. That's it. There we go. Look, he's not happy. He will want to review that footage that we have seen. He will have a different version. Whether he'll go and give that version as a driver or as a, the, the de facto team principal. So he's very unhappy indeed. And I have a certain amount of sympathy because in that phase going into Paddock Hill Bend, he wasn't looking up the inside. He didn't expect the short horse car to be halfway yeah. alongside. When he turned across, all of a sudden he's got a car which he didn't realise was there. And this is Matthews, look, he just drifts across to the grass, doesn't he? Just gets it slightly wrong offline. I mean, I don't understand, truthfully, why, whether you're focusing so much on Sterling's that you don't know where you are on the outside of the corner approaching it, but a side swipe into the tyre bails, and the binding, the rubber binding that hopes those, holds those tyres, probably bodywork damage, but nothing very much more, so that car can be prepared and ready for the second round later this afternoon. And it's Stoltz, Bortolotti and Bastian, one, two and three. In fourth place, Calvin van der Linde. In fifth place here, Shea Davis. Vincent Abril in the Mercedes is sixth. So this is the next battle to watch for now. Can Vincent Abril get fifth place off the Australian? Shea Davis racing here for the first time. We've seen him in Blancpain GT Series Asia, now making the move across to the European scene. Vincent Abril switching from Bentley to Mercedes, and he's got Ricky Collard switching from BMW to Aston Martin, tucked up behind him, then Tuncho, then Beertz, and the pit window is about to open. Well, the FFF racing team drivers that are still in the race are ready for their stints, and let's see when Lucas Stolz pits. Does he come in early to give way to Mauro Engel, or does he stay out and try and keep building this gap over Mirko Bortolotti? And then you think about the relative pace of the second stint drivers. Who is quicker, Engel or Engelhardt? Because that is going to be the battle for the race lead. In fairness to Thomas Neubauer, who's not really raced at this level before, he may not be able to replicate the pace of Nico Bastian in third spot. No, I would think that Nico Bastian really, although he is a silver driver, he's way, way beyond that in terms of his pace. You can see Mirko Portolotti really just, he just threw the Lamborghini into Pedicle Bend in his pursuit of the race leader to come across the line. And there, Collard and Tunjo go through. Right, Davis, Abril and Viertz are all into the pit lane. So that's uh, two Audis and one Mercedes. And as Vance and Abril will be handing over to Raffaele Marcello. There's the fifth place, or almost the fifth place, Audi, right at the very end of the pit lane. So the Aka ASP Mercedes will be working already before the ID has come to a standstill. And there, throw on the inside line, Timo Bogoslavski to go 17th at the expense of Wolfgang Triller and also going through Simon Gachet, trying to recover after his early dramas because he got caught up in the melee at the first lap as well. Right, tyre change done, number two drops down and away now blasts Christopher Mies. 87 is in for Jean-Luc Bobelic to morph into Jim Clark. The Audi's got out, just running, as they got ahead, so Mercedes did 
really benefit from that pit stop. I thought maybe because they were working sooner, they may have made that pit stop slightly more advantageous to them. But it looks like the five, they, or what was the fifth place, the Shea Davis Audi has uh, done well. Yeah, both the Audis are at least two seconds quicker on yeah. that pit stop yeah. than the Mercedes. Much, much quicker. Yeah, that's WRT. And we know they're good at stops. So in comes the 63 Lamborghini. Bogoslavski, Gachet and Kompank are all under investigation for a yellow flag infringement. In has come 63, so Bortolotti gives way to Engelhardt. Tires go on. Two mechanics to do all the tires. One carries and fits, the other does the gun. And difficulty with the right left front going on. You've got to be fit to do this. Yeah. Mechanics well trained. Big heavy tires and wheels. Everything's done. Away now goes Christian Engelhardt. Key is where will the number four Mercedes be? Has yet to make its pit stop. That's where it is. And there is the lead car coming in now. So they've followed in the right yeah. thing to do. If your challenger comes in ahead of you, you come in the next lap. And that means that Nico Bastian will inherit the race lead. And Bastian has just done an absolute best in the first in the middle sector. He's just done the fastest lap, Nico Bastian, with the road clear ahead of him. Down the pit road comes Stoll. So, 46.7 seconds, the pit stop time to try to beat here. I'll tell you what it is, because the clock is ticking away. So Mara Engel gets into the car. Lucas Stoll did what he was required to do. He maintained the lead. His tires being changed on the Black Falcon Mercedes, the team run by Sean Paul Breslin. Stoll stands beside the car, lets it go. Here comes the Lamborghini. Luckily for the Mercedes, they're towards the tail of the pit lane, so they're going to manage to get back out on track. There is the Lamborghini coming down, so the gap net net is probably about two seconds. The gap fractionally, in fact, in favour towards the Black Falcon Mercedes. The pit stop time for the Mercedes, a second and a half faster than the Lamborghini, so they've gained a second and a half yep. in the pits. The capacity comes in now, so still another five minutes of this pit lane. Oh, so the true picture of what will happen, and Nick Bastian will stay out. No, he's not. So yeah, he's, he's in. He's in. I thought they might have kept him out as long as possible to give them. But they're not racing for victory per se. All they're racing for is to win the Silver Cup category. So this car, Mario Engel, will go back into the race lead. So it's Engel versus Engel Hart that we now need to be looking at. There is the Lamborghini behind. So let's see what that gap is going to be like at the end of this lap. Raffaele Marchiello will be in the mix as well, having done the fastest lap of the race. Bastian runs away from the Acker ASP car. Jared Polycon's team, Autosport Promotion, is the ASP bit. Acker is Jean de Bovelic's company that's invested in the team. And here come the race leaders. So now, at the end of lap number 19, we're about to see what the gap is between Mauro Engel, Christian Engelhardt as they go through. But actually, they're going to be behind, are they not? The Bastian and Bogoslaski car. So that has managed to do a very good pit stop indeed. Uh, not Bogoslaski, Neubauer, I should say. Number 89, Thomas Neubauer, whose pit stop was 43.2 seconds. So that's put now number 89, Mercedes, into the lead of the race. And what has done also has put the 63 Lamborghini right up the boot lid of what had been the leading car, the number four Mercedes, because it's now backed up behind these cars. Looks to go down the inside. Mauro Engel gets that job done to one car, this two-car battle, and it's nothing to do with the lead of the race. So he's clear. Christian Engelhardt now is going to think, well, where am I going to find a way past without letting the number four gain that advantage of having relatively clear air before he's got to find his way around the sister Mercedes. There's there Mirko. Is. Come on. Yep. Yeah, Shine, exactly. Go on. Go on. Tell him, Mirko. You tell him. But at the moment, the Lamborghini is being delayed by a car that is coming into, coming the, into the pits. But Bertolot Bertolo was so upset yeah. because he was saying, get out of the way, you've got to make your pit stop, you're destroying our race. Yeah. Simon Gachet had not pitted, apologies. So he's in now, but Bortolotti has just watched that gap go up from one second to 2.2. So this is the view of Mauro Engel. Ahead is Thomas Neubauer. Let's stay on board for that and see if this gap will close. We're starting at 11 tenths of a second. Well, you have to assume that Neubauer would be under pressure from Abraham Engel, but it isn't the case. And he's managed to consolidate the last lap between the two drivers was a tenth of a second to the favour of Neubauer. So that 89 Acker ASP Mercedes, for some reason, has got that fraction more pace. Now, this is the battle going on between Jim Clark and Phil Keane. It is to be second in Pro-Am. We've seen the leader, David Perrell. Uh, two quick drivers here, Jim Clark 
versus Phil Keane. They're both doing the full season of sprint and endurance races. Jim Parr, remember, was in the walls of Malta. And Phil Keane, who's taken over from Hiroshi Hamaguchi, looking for a way by. And this, in replay, is Neubauer running a bit wide at Sterling. Yeah, this is the lap, not the lap we're currently on, this is the previous lap. So that's the first time I've seen Neubauer do anything other than wheel perfect to drive. So there's a car stationary coming out of Graham Hill Bend. And it could be on fire, actually, there's a lot of smoke coming out of it. There it is. Taylor Proto, the American-based British driver, runs away, but this is not a good race for the Orange One FFF racing team, is it? No, it is not. It's... Up front, the gap going up all the while between Neubauer and Engel, 2.2 seconds. It has become five minutes are on the clock, and you're looking back from the Aston Martin, down now towards Sterling's. Through the trees, up through the gears. That is the race-leading car. Three minutes are on the clock for Thomas Neubauer. What a drive this has been. He's got into the lead on the pit stops, hung on to the lead, and despite the pressure from behind of Myro Engel, built the gap, gap came down a bit, he's rebuilt it, and Thomas Neubauer then leads the way. That's Lucas Stolz, the man that started on pole position. His car is second in the hands of Myro Engel, but try as they might, they haven't been able to do nothing about this. Aka ASP car, Nico Bastian, almost hidden in his jacket there, he doesn't want to see. But we're nearly done, because through with two more laps to run goes here, number 89, the leading Mercedes, Thomas Neubauer, goes through Paddock, slides a little through the corner, and he's wide up the curb, and he hangs on to everything, Engel behind him, the gap two seconds. And then this is for fourth and fifth still, Clever Schmidt ahead of Raffaele Marciello. Marciello thinks about the inside, can't do it, goes to the outside line here, and they're being caught by Tom Gamble. Now Tom is in his first GT3 race, there's the gap finally! The door is open, Clement Schmidt is going to get mugged because in a straight line through and up and past him will go Raffaele Marciello. One tiny error, slightly offline, and the other out is going to go through as well, or is it? Tom Gamble has a look, but no, the door is closed just in the nick of time by Clement Schmidt. Tom Gamble, last year's BRDC McLaren Autosport Young Driver of the Year, he is right there on the back. It's a career change away from single-seaters. He was a race winner in British Formula 3 last year, into GT cars, and he wants another place before the very end. If Tom Gamble could be in the leading Audi at the end of his first GT race, it would be quite a thing. But into Clark Curve, it is going to be a race win for the Acker ASP Mercedes. The first Rompan GT World Challenge Europe race is won by Thomas Neuler and Nico Bastian. The Mercedes comes across the line to win. Second is Mario Engel with Lukas Stoltz. And the gap two seconds, a rather muted response from Lukas Stoltz, thinking, why did we not win that? Our race winners are with John Watson. Nico, Silver Cup winner, but you've won the race outright. Was that in the plan? <laughs> for sure not. It was not on our list, uh, but we take it for sure. Uh, it was a mega race. Um, the start was, was tight uh, with Bottolotti, and uh, also Luca did a good job at the start, and then we, yeah, we pulled the gap uh, with three cars. And then uh, we knew that uh, we want to stay long out uh, for the first stint, so my car was definitely better at the end of my stint than at the beginning. So I pushed like crazy. The two laps I had uh, without any car in front of me, I pushed like qualifying or even more and it paid off. We had a mega pit stop, also thanks to Akka, to the guys. They are draining so much during winter time. And now we won the first GT World Challenge race in the, yeah, which is existing now since a few weeks just. And Toma also did a mega job. Well, you did a great job. Fantastic pit stop. Thomas, can you believe you've just won overall, not just won your class? Uh, well, not really for the moment, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm just excited for the moment. Now, you were under pressure. Mario Engel gave you a lot of pressure yeah. midway through your stint. He closed the gap down to three quarters of a second, but you stretched it back out again. Yeah, I was really trying to like focus on me, on my job. And uh, yeah, he was pushing hard. I saw the, the, flashing, the flashing lights behind me. Well, you know, I just kept head down and it worked well. Let's confirm the results then. An Acker ASP team victory. Thomas Neubauer and Nico Bastian, the drivers, ahead of Lucas Stoltz and Mario Engel. Mirko Bortolotti and Christian Engelhart take fourth ahead of Vincent Abril and Raphael Marcello. Right at the very end to jump ahead of the Clement Schmidt, Kelvin van der Linde, Audi, the similar car of Tom Gamble and Shea Davis sixth. Collard and Kirchhoff are seventh from Hutchison, Vavish, Tunco and Brokers ninth, and Milan Doncha, Matthew Drudy. Rounding out the top ten, the winning trophies go to Nico Bastian and then Thomas Neubauer. As I say, a great debut for him and uh, a perfect second stint. Very, very impressive indeed. Thomas Neubauer, Nico Bastian, the race winners at Brands Hatch in this first Blancpain GT World Challenge Europe race.
So that was all the drama of race one, and the grid for race two is now formed here at Brands Hatch as we get set to go racing. Uh, David Addison and John Watson trackside. The grid is not quite complete because number five Audi missing from it. The car that uh, you saw in the highlights damaged with uh, Kim Louis Schramm having the damage at the first corner. Frank Stiffler should start for this race. Now the car is not on the grid. Whether it's going to be able to start from the pit lane or whether it's now too badly damaged, we await news. But uh, certainly the car is not there. Uh, track temperature 14 degrees. It is dry, but not exactly the warmest of days here at Brands Hatch. But as I say, the grid is formed, ready to go. And pole position after the quirky session that began with everyone trying to get a banker lap in before it rained. Some did and some didn't. And then we had a red flag anyway with an accident and the rain came. Fabian Schiller is on pole position. Brands Hatch starts with the plunge through Paddock Hill Bend up towards Druid, downhill at Graham Hill, short straight to Cooper Strait into the left at Surtees, onto the Grand Prix loop, down Pilgrims Drop to Hawthorns into the second sector, short straight to Westfield, turn right, right drop down, climb again into Sheen Curve, turn left into Sector 3 at Stirlings, another short straight into the long right of Clark Curve up towards the line. You're working all the time, the drivers love it because it is an old school circuit, but there's not much runoff and that has been, of course, always a factor for the uh, Bronfan GT visit to Browns Hatch because if you go off, it bites and it bites hard. And that was certainly true yesterday with a number of cars in difficulties and in damage. Now, I'm looking at, down onto the grid, I think another one that's missing is 555, the Taylor Proto Lamborghini that uh, went up in smoke in the first race. I don't think that is there at the back of the grid. So there are a couple of cars missing. Uh, but uh, number five Audi missing off the grid and the 555 Lamborghini both missing because of their travails in race one. Now, it might be that they can not go to the grid and use this extra time to work and therefore start from the pit lane. Uh, but uh, it could also be that they are going to be uh, completely non-starters. Get well soon, Richard Hay from the SRO team. Uh, Richard, a GT racer and television uh, producer as well. And uh, Richard, get well soon from all of us involved in the championship here at Brands Hatch. Now, down on the grid, not only do we have uh, the grid ready to go, but we've also got John Watson, and he has managed to find the pole man. Fabian Schiller will start from pole in the Mercedes. He's with John. Fabian, fantastic effort, pole position. Yeah, it was pretty good qualifying yesterday. Mixed weather, I mean, do you think you were lucky or I believe your team and you did the right thing and got the time when it mattered? Definitely, I mean, we made the right call. We went out of the pits immediately. For sure, luck was a little bit on our side with the rain coming out after we set a pretty good lap time. But still, I think we have potential to be up here even when it would have been completely dry. So I think it has nothing to do with luck. It's more skill and team. So, um, yeah, very happy with the pole position. I think um, if we get a clean start, we're going to keep it. Say a clean start, pole position, Paddock Hill Bend. We saw the start of the first race today. There was contact that was slightly behind the front row of the grid. Nevertheless, there's a lot of expectation, a lot of pressure on you. Of course, yeah, but I mean, that's, it's my job to race cars, you know, so I have to ha uh, deal with the pressure and I think we should be fine. Get a clean start. Like you said, Paddock Hill Bend, the first corner is pretty tricky, but I think once we went through there, um, it should clean up and should be, yeah, not a problem anymore. Well, your sister car, the 89, won the first race today. Does that make you feel that it's your turn this time? Well, I mean, we do the best we can. For sure, the win is the aim. Um, we will go for it, of course. I mean, the win this morning showed that our car is very quick around the track and the team is obviously doing a great job with pit stops as well. So if everything runs clean, for sure, the win is the aim. Well, if I see you in Park Ferme, I will call you Fabian. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, the pole position driver, number 90, Fabian Schiller, uh, starting from pole. Nick Foster is going to be lining up alongside. As I say, it's a very, very jumbled grid because effectively we had uh, the rain come just as people were getting to the end of their first flying lap and they're all on slick so some made it through some didn't uh, and then that was it the track was soaking uh, so nick foster will go from second on the grid that's the car that stein scotthorst suffered great damage with in race one but the good news is it's on the grid stein good to see you on the grid i mean you only got about 300 meters up the hill in race one it all ended abruptly exactly yeah happy to be here to be honest uh credits to the team they did great uh as soon as the car came in they started working really hard and up till probably 10 or 15 minutes before the, the pit lane went green, he was not sure if we were going to make it, but clearly they did. And, uh, and Nick just said the car feels all right, steering is a bit off, but other than that, it's, uh, 
It's sweet. Well, I know the guys were working flat out. They didn't even have time to clear the gravel. It's all on the racetrack underneath it. Yeah, exactly. We, we didn't have time to take the floor off. We wouldn't have made that. So there's still a bit of gravel in, but it should be pretty clear now. Um, and then we should be able to, uh, to race. So a drag, a drag race between you, the 55 and the 90 Mercedes. Tell me what's going to happen. Yeah, it's going to be tight. Um, I think traditionally the outside in Brands Edge is not the best place to start because the, as you can see, the straight is like a long right hand corner. So you have less meters on the, on the inside. Plus there's quite a bit of marbles on the outside. So um, yeah, I think it's going to be key to either get a good start and get ahead of him or to just slot in behind uh, and try to have that inside for the first and second corner. If not, um, I'll have my fingers crossed. So we, good luck. Thank you. So good to hear from Stein Scott Horse then at the end uh, of a difficult uh, lunch break, such as it was for the team. Uh, there's Mauro Engels' Mercedes that lines up third on the grid. Now, Mauro, again, we expected more from him that first race, and it didn't quite come, but as he made the point to John Watson post-race, the closer you get, the more you struggle in the aero. Uh, so uh, Engel eventually had to just settle for the points for second place. And uh, down on the grid as well is the man that presides over all of this global GT success, Stefan Rattel. Stefan, World Challenge Europe here, first round at Brands Hatch. Yes, it's great to, to link with, with the Blancpain GT, Europe and Asia, with the World Challenge in America. So well, that's it, we made it, these 18 races around the world, all with the same title, where manufacturers can go points across all championships. This year we're pleased with, with Mercedes, AMG and Ferrari doing it. So I think it's a, you know, it's a good start and we hope that next year more manufacturers will, will understand it and will score points throughout all the race. First lap into the first corner, first race, very exciting. A bit too exciting. We prefer it to be a little bit quieter, uh, but sprint is always, you know, it's always very challenging, but I uh, hope this one will be a, a bit quieter and we'll have good racing. Thank you. Thank you. Stefan Rattel, who was a great fan of Brands Hatch. In fact, he did race here quite a long time ago. There was a British Touring Car Championship meeting, which had rather randomly a Lamborghini Super Trofeo round as a support race, in which Stefan competed, going back to 2000 from memory. Uh, and uh, he has always uh, enjoyed the British GT rounds here and jumped at the opportunity to bring the, as it then was, Blancpain Sprint Series to Brands Hatch a few years ago. Right, the grid is starting to clear, and that might give us an opportunity to have a little stroll up and see who is where. Pole position will be the number 90 Mercedes of Fabian Schiller, and it's Nick Foster starting alongside for Attempto in the Audi. The second row of the grid, Mauro Engel, definitely one to watch from there, and lining up alongside in the Aston Martin of R Motorsport is Marvin Kirchhofer. On the third row, there is the race one winner, Thomas Neubauer, and on the outside of that row, is the reigning sprint champion Raffaele Marchiello and of course Neubau from the Silver Cup along with Nico Bastian as his co-driver. Grid being cleared of the Pirelli grid girls, Raffaele Marchiello. Again, that car didn't really come alive in the way we anticipated in race one, so expect more here. On the fourth row of the grid, there's Clement Schmidt for Attempto and alongside him, uh, his teammate, Matteo Drudi. The two Audis then lining up alongside one another. Tom Gamble in the green Audi for WRT goes next. Tom new to GT racing this year, having been in British Formula 3 as a race winner last year. The BRDC McLaren Autosport Young Driver of the Year Award winner. Then he's got Hugo de Sadelier alongside in the car that retired because it wouldn't restart in the pits in race one. Marco Mapelli will start 5-6-3 Lamborghini and Fred Mavish in the blue Audi is alongside. That Lamborghini, the one of course that got the penalty in race one. Jim Pla in the red Acker ASP Mercedes has the South African driver David Perel alongside there, two of the guns in the Pro-Am Cup. Opposition there comes from Andrea Bertolini in the AF Corsa run. Black and white Ferrari next on the grid, and alongside him is Florian Schultzer, the Am Cup entrant, showing the car with Wolfgang Triller. The gap that you see is where Frank Stippler is not, and the car is not at the end of the pit lane either, so I fear that's a non-starter. 25, Christopher Hauser is there. Number 10, Rick Brokers, is on the next row of the grid in the Audi. Alongside him is 519, that's Phil Keane. Behind them, the Audi is Marcus Winkelhock, and alongside the black uh, Audi, that is number one, Dries van Tort. They are two to watch, unquestionably. And what's become the back row of the grid is Christopher Meese, who went off into the gravel and was then collected by Stefan Ortelli. And alongside is Christian Engelhardt, whose car was damaged in Q1 and never got there for the chance to go in Q2. So the other one that's missing from the grid is the Lamborghini of Taylor Proto, which would have been at the very back of the grid. Uh, because it was damaged in Q1 as well, but that car then had its engine fire in race one, so he's missing. So a couple of gaps, I'm afraid of the 
busy weekend, the hectic weekend of the trails for some of the teams have depleted the grid by a couple going into race two. I'm keeping an eye to the pit lane to see if anything else appears out of a garage. But as Alain Adon waves the green flag, the cars are released onto the formation lap for the second race of the Blancpain GT World Challenge Europe here at Brands Hatch. And you've got people in strange places on the grid. Some of the quick drivers lower down, some of the drivers that you might expect to find mid-grid or at the front. It's going to be a very interesting first few laps. It could either be a really hectic first few laps or it could be mayhem. We'll wait and see what turns out. Are we going to get lots of great racing or is it all going to be dependent upon pit stops and survival going through the first few corners? Let's see. So here they come then, ready to uh, make their way down to Graham Hill Bend. They come out of Druids. So, everybody now ready to turn their way onto Cooper Strait. And so, the pole position car, Fabian Schiller's Mercedes, at the very uh, front of the queue. And it will be him versus Nick Foster on the run in towards Paddock Hill Band. And let's hope that we get through without the same drama. Going down the pit lane is Frank Stippler's Audi. So they have got different front bodywork on the car, but Stippler is going to be in. It's been a frantic job to get the car done, and they've done it in the nick of time. So Frank Stippler is going to start from the end of the pit lane. The car's making their way then now down through Hawthorns, but that's great work by the Phoenix team to get Frank Stippler to the end of the pit lane, ready to go. That means the one missing is Taylor Proto's uh, Lamborghini. But the cars then now making their way into the right-hander of Westfield and Fabian Schiller, Nick Foster, the two at the front of the grid, set to go racing very shortly indeed. Well, we've heard from some of the drivers on the grid a great degree of expectation going into this second race, John Watson, but also perhaps having seen what happened in race one, there's a bit of trepidation as well. Well, it's going to be very interesting up into Paddock Hill Band once again because what we've got is a mix of the overall grid in what would normally be seen as being slightly out of position. But Fabian Schiller's time was a bona fide time, Absolutely. as was the time for the 55 Audi beside it. Now, that car sitting in the grid was dropping gravel, <laughs> and Stan Stonehorse told us they didn't have time to take the floor, the underbody of the car off. So when they went out for the lap and they came to a stop on the grid, all of a sudden it's depositing, like a, like a herd of cows depositing in a field, <laughs> but it was depositing gravel on the racetrack. Well, hopefully it's all gone. People behind won't like it, but let's see. So here we go then. We are about to get race two of the Blancpain GT World Challenge Europe underway. The cars turn their way up through Clark Curve. Side by side grid order. If the race director is happy, yes, the lights will go green. We are racing, and a good start is made by Fabian Schiller. He gets the drop. Maro Engel on the inside line, going for track position against the Audi. Can he get past Shot Horse as they get towards Paddock Hill Bend? He's up the curve. Shot Horse has lasted longer than he did in race one, and he's still second. Engel is third. There's a car trailing, a bit of smoke in the background. There's one off the road, and that a long way into the gravel, I'm afraid. On the outside of Paddock Hill Bend, he's going to bring out a yellow flag, and there it is. It's the Audi. It's Winkelhock's car by the look of it, and I think Tom Gamble got some rear damage as well. But the cars come on the Cooper straight. Fabian Schiller leads the way, and Winkelhock's Audi is in the gravel. Fabian Schiller, superstar. That's what he needed. That's what he wanted. He got the advantage. He was on full decision. Not always the best place, but on a rolling start, the disadvantage is very much less. Took the advantage, took the lead. Nick Foster in second. Down they come towards Hawthorne's then, keeping an eye to see whether or not the car in the gravel at Paddock needs to be moved under a safety car. Let us wait and find out as the field turns through. We need to be keeping an eye to the Van Tours, the Mises, the Engelharts of this world to see what progress can be made into Westfield. They come there out of the race is Marcus Finkelhoff. Pretty miserable day for him, I'm afraid to say, as he clambers to a place of safety. Is the car far enough out of harm's way for the race to carry on without needing to be neutralised? Well, it's starting to be a yellow flag going into Paddock Hill Bend. That'll stop anybody with thoughts of trying to make a pass up into the corner. And it'll also have a bearing on people coming out of Paddock up the hill into Druids. That's true enough as the cars swoop through. Clark Curve then, here they come, over the timing line, it's Fabian Schiller leading the way, the Australian Nick Foster running in second place, Mauro Engel is third, in fourth place then as they break the beam and go through Paddock Hill, Ben now is Raffaele Marchiello, fifth is Marvin Kirchhofer, in sixth is Matthew Drudy, seventh is Neubauer, eighth is Schmidt, ninth is De Sardinier, tenth is Mapelli. now where are these gun drivers, sixteenth is Mies, nineteenth is Engelhardt, twentieth is Van Tor, twenty-first from the pit lane is Stippler. 
I mean, the problem, whether it's you're leading at the front or you're at the tail of the field, there's the 17 coming in, so was that the contact between the Winkelock car and the sort of fact, safety car just coming in directly behind it to Tom Gamble? So two cars. Clearly, that's interesting, that was the ID, the Winkelhock car that's in the, in the gravel at the Paddock Hill Bend, when the 17 coming into the pitch with the left rear, so I assume that's been nose to rear contact. So let's have a look, there's the green Audi in midfield, and look, four of them. Oh, no way. Live oh, Gamble no, 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 no. The Lambo. And bodywork, look, loads of carbon fibre, yeah. that is not, not ideal at all, because that cannot be cleared while the race is active. So Gamble was involved in one incident, Winkelhock further back on the grid just perhaps got a puncture by going over the carbon fibre, but have a look, that four wide was never going to work, bits fly, so Gamble's tyre goes down because of the contact. Now look at Winkelhock, he turns through the corner and then the car goes left, possibly well, with a puncture. I think that he's had a cut tyre just cut yeah. down, and that's what happens, you get all this carbon fibre shards, wants to see so much went up in the air, let them put landed on the racetrack, some of them will have fluttered away. There it is, there's the beginning of it, and if you happen to be in the wrong Wrong place at the wrong time. Marcus Winkelhock appears to be the, the victim of all that and uh, cut straight off into the gravel and comes to a rest. It doesn't really hit, it just comes to a rest at the barrier. And there it is, looking back from the R Motorsport Aston Martin. So much for trepidation and caution at turn one. Well, they largely survived, but not everybody. Tom Gamble then into the pit lane, and it's a long stop as they try and repair the damage and sort out the puncture. Winkelhock out of the race. So, what this means is that Fabian Schiller leads the way. And there is Tom Gamble out of the car, out of the race. Day done. Great shape because they went so well in race one. Yes, and one would have hoped, there's Winklehock's car being craned away, that with the rolling start, we may well avoid these kind of contacts if you get into Paddock Hill Bend, not unfamiliar, uh, a point of always a pinch point, but having four cars wide, I mean, the, the racetrack is barely wide enough for three cars at racing speed to have four squeezing up there. Well, it had to happen and it did. So let's look at the order. It's Fabian Scheller in the lead, Nick Foster second, Mercedes ahead of Audi, third and fourth, Mauro Engel, Rafael Marchiello, Mercedes, Mercedes, fifth is Marvin Kirchhoffer's Aston Martin, sixth, Matteo Drudis, Audi, seventh, Thomas Neubauer, Mercedes, eighth, Clement Schmidt, Audi, ninth, Hugo de Sardinia, Aston Martin, tenth, Marco Mappelli, Lamborghini, Jim Plyer is eleventh, Fred Vervich, twelfth, Andrea Bertolini is in thirteenth race, that's Vervich in the blue Audi going through the shot now. 14th is David Parrell and 15th is Christopher Haase, Mies 16th, Phil Keane 18th, Engelhart 19th and Dries van Tour 20th, still looking to make progress. Well, it's going to be very difficult and all you can do is just, I mean, if you want to be impatient, you run the risk of getting involved. The opportunities so evenly matched is the field that uh, if you want to take a punt up the inside into Druids, for example, well, it's almost inevitable you'll collide with the car that you're attempting to overtake. You need to make the overtake at the very point of your exit paddock bend, not at the point you're entering into uh, Druids. And there is on board with Greece van Thor, very unhappy, down in 20th position. And there's an effort being made because under attack, look, is to suddenly a Marco Mappelli, Italian GT champion, comes up to challenge. So it's Aston Martin versus Lamborghini, side by side, down towards Hawthorne. Mappelli on the outside line gets his nose in front, but he can't cover off the move. So back through on the inside goes to Sadonir, and then look behind him. You've got Jim Pla looking for a way through. Pla attacking and defending because Verbiche is crawling all over him. And it's absolutely nuts up at the Westfield bend. I mean, there are two abreast coming. I've never seen and contact again through Dingle Dell up into Sheen Curve. I mean, this is a one hour race, not a one lap sprint for your life. And David Perel in the green Ferrari has just got past Andrea Bertolini for second in Pro Am, so a change there. In all the fun and games going on, and more drama. 63 oh, down the heart, and that is Phil Keane in stripe as well. Did the two Lamborghinis come together on the approach into Sterling's? That was certainly Phil Keane, and the I'm not sure if that was the, the second of those two Lamborghinis. Yeah, that was the number. It was Engelhardt. Wasn't Engelhardt. It? I think it may have been Engelhardt indeed. So Engelhardt and Keane, who were 18th and 19th, Keane ahead, have had a moment at Sterling's. So we'll try and get to the bottom of that as the cars go through. Schiller is leading by 1.7 seconds. Number two Audi is Christopher Mies on the back of Christopher Hauser. They used to share cars. Now they are, although still Audi factory drivers, rivals in different teams. Santalot versus WRT. Downhill they go, heading into Graham Hill Bend now. Well, you've got a small lead being built up by Fabian Schiller. Nick Foster in second is now the lead of a chain of cars that runs all the way down to eighth place, Clement Schmidt. So, in effect, the number 55 idea is that's controlling the pace of third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh, and eighth. They'll all want to find a way through if they can manage it. I don't know how they will. That's 55, uh, that's the 88. Now, making his way up to the back of four. So, Mario Engel being pressurized by Raffaele Marcello. We didn't see this in race one. This is what we want to see these two hot guns in Mercedes going at it. 
Absolutely right. So then we are on lap number five. Challenge there, side by side. Mapelli this time makes it work on the inside line. Does he go through? Yes, he does. Mapelli goes ninth. Is he expensive to suddenly? Vervich dive bombs up the inside. Contact is just about avoided somehow. But Fred Vervich is in a big hurry here. Elbows out. He wants to come by, but the Aston Martin is filling the road ahead of him. Yeah, Fred Vervich said that his car is about half a second, three quarters of a second down on what he would expect it to be, and he doesn't know why. The team doesn't know why. So he's having to take chances, force issues, as he did into Sterling. But look at the gaggle of cars behind me. It's, I think this is a real, real motor race. Mix and match grid. And what you're going to get are people out of position, people wanting to get up to their natural position. And just as I paused for breath a moment ago, David Perel dived through in the green Ferrari to take over the lead of Pro-Am. So it's now uh, David Perel from Jim Pla and then Andrea Bertolini as they come downhill through Graham Hill. And there is Dries Van Thorpe, who is looking to get past Rick Brokers. And he makes the move on the inside, going into Surtees. Dries Van Thorpe goes through up the inside line. He's a more experienced driver, so he goes by. Mies all over the back of Hasa. And here comes Vervich once again tries to get ahead of De Sadelier. The Audi has its nose in front, but it's on the outside line, and also up the inside line comes David Parel. He can't find a way by. Oh, can he? Yes! Oh, oh no! Contact round goes Vavish. And it is Bedlam on the exit oh. of Hawthorne. The worst part of the racetrack for contact to occur, and high-speed exit, high-speed contact, fibre support. Certainly four or five guys, including the 963 Lamborghini, may be involved in that as well. Bertolini is definitely out of it there. Vich was caught up in it, and others try to get themselves going. There's debris all over the road. That's as if your Paris compact looking concerned. Is my car involved in it? Yes, it is. Dries Van Thorne, look, number one, has got lots of front damage. Rick Brokers, his Audi is a broken car for Brokers. This could well be a safety car to clear up the mess. Well, I think the amount of carbon fibre that's going to be on the racetrack will certainly require brushing away. There's heavy damage. That Ferrari has been punch board and counter oh. all weekend. So the yellows are out, they're dragging the markers back as well. Dries Van Thorpe with lots of front damage, so full course yellow is called. Full course yellow we have. That instantly slows the pace down. The race director will probably put the safety car out. Now talk us through this, John. OK, Fred Bavich trying to make a pass on the Aston Martin. He's in the wrong part of the track. He then comes in, but the Ferrari David Parel is inside and there is nowhere for those two cars to go. So they make contact, which in turn, as the cars come back across the racetrack, leads off to this... Well, as you can see exactly what's happened those that were on the left hand side of the track were caught out by those coming from right to left so three cars on the left two on the right walking wounded barely and well, how many of those cars have been able to return certainly back to the pit lane but it's the amount of carbon fiber this was never ever going to work Fred Ravich tried on the outside, he went back to the inside, but David Perel was there in the Ferrari, and he wasn't about to concede or make it easy. But you can see Ravich spins back, catches the, the black Ferrari, then others, the door pops open. That's Haasa, that's Christopher Haasa gone. Bertolini's car with big damage, Brokers, Van Thor, Stippler, all involved in it. And the pit lane now is filling up rapidly because all these broken cars are in. Vavish is back in the race after a, a, a punctured tyre has been changed, but we'll see whether that's going to work. Now, imagine Bertolini. He is about to feel a big whack. Turns yes. through the corner, wait for the bang. He's driving and doing nothing wrong there is the incident. He, ha he suddenly has to lock up. The car then... There it is, bang in the rear. He's spinning around, going from left over to the right-hand side of the track. Does he actually hit the barrier? I think he just manages to graze down it. Not that, but the damages to the rear of that car, as I say, it got damaged here yesterday, it got damaged in Monza. The poor car must yeah. be at a complex by now. <laughs> and Andrea Bertolini, former FIA GT champion, FIA GT1 world champion, no mean driver, but we've not seen the best of him this weekend, thanks to circumstance. Rick Brokers, that car's, I wouldn't have thought, going anywhere no. apart from home. No, that's going to be loaded up on the transporter and taken back to Belgium. So, and that's a real mess. Bertolini was, was harpooned, wasn't he? Oh, yeah. I mean, the right rear, I mean, it's the right rear corner of this car consistently has been hit. was hit in Monza, was been damaged here yesterday, damaged now again. There's the, the 63 Christian Engelhardt. Now, has he maybe picked up somebody's bodywork? Is that his bodywork? I, I think it's the Ferraris, isn't it? I'm it's not the sure. I just only got a glimpse yeah. of it as it came through Sterling. So Christian Engelhardt and the 63, it is indeed yes. part of the Ferrari. Look at it. Yes. Well, I wonder if that improved the downforce or not. It's stuck, isn't it? It's completely wedged in the front bodywork. Yeah, it's just that there's, a, there's a, that green from the 333 Ferrari. He's not going to come in. 
so there it is. It's the new Lamborghini, a combination <laughs> of Lamborghini and Ferrari, merged into one. Well, <laughs> I'm not sure Mr. Ferrari, Mr. Lamborghini, <laughs> wherever you happen to be, great gentlemen, would, uh, would want to concur with that one. And that's what's left of Christopher Hauser's car. That's the, the air-conditioned version. Yeah, the door is... I don't know how the door is hanging on. I mean, Christopher Hauser's on the left-hand side of the car. The door is barely... Uh, one of the hinges has gone completely. You were only supposed to blow the... Complete this sentence. Uh, into the pit lane, hopefully, will come the now much cooler Christopher Hauser. I mean, there's not much fun when you're in the middle of a, a high-speed spin to find your passenger door popping open when there's no passenger there to open it up for you. It looks like the right rear is... The car looks like it's actually crabbing. I suspect that there may be a little bit of rear suspension damage as well as bodywork to that car. I mean, we're being moderately flippant about this and talking about the damage and saying they'll all be going back to base oh. to be repaired. But oh. bear in mind, they've all got to be at Silverstone on Thursday to set up on Friday because the next well, no, yeah, endurance yeah, yes. is, is less than a week away. Yeah, I mean, once they get the cars back into the transportation, get up to Silverstone, the body panels come off very yeah. easily. It's, the, it's potential damage to the bits that you cannot see, i.e. the suspension components, the suspension mounting points, the chassis itself. Remember, these cars are be production based cars. They've got these anti or these crush deformable structures in the front of them, two of them on another side. And if they get a major whack, then they, are, they do what they're designed to do. They're designed to deform to you know, reduce the amount of energy and, and potential damage to the, the, the cockpit area. So if those get damaged, then that means a new chassis. Now they're going to try and send Hazza back out by the look of it, tape everything up. And it's worth going out because you might get points in your class, so um, we'll send him out. Now let's try and remember the Phil Keane and Christian Engelhart earlier moment in Sterling. So we saw the end of it. This is from a rear angle. And I think the two Lamborghinis. Yeah, he, he got into the back of Phil Keane's car. You can see the rear wing of the Phil Keane car is getting raised up. So uh, was it the 63? I think it was the 63. It got there. We are on board. So there goes Keane, he got a tap. Yeah. Vantor goes for a gap. He's clear. I mean, it's, I mean, I thought the first race, certainly at the beginning of it, was a bit nuts. But <laughs> this, and I mean, people talk about having reverse grids to get away from predictability to make it more exciting. Maybe that's what we just want. But the cost, what is the cost? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm waiting for John to do his normal calm down, dear, line, because the, 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 whatever they've had for lunch, John, it's amazing. Well, I've, I've watched some of them eating, and I'll tell you what, there was a lot of sugar content in what they were eating, <laughs> and maybe that's what's right. You know, we've told the sugar police, don't take sugar, it's going to be bad for you. Don't do this, it's bad for you. Police, you do your job, let us eat what we want. So everybody here is on their toes, look, waiting. For, when the full course yellow is rescinded, they want to be going. They want to be on their toes. And so they're all almost tripping over each other, expecting the green flag to fly any second. Yeah, but I have to wait until Fabian Schiller decides to go. And what Fabian Schiller may well choose to do is not go until he comes across the start finish line. And then everybody who's all bunched up together, he's gone. No, no what are they doing? We've got the safety car out, so the safety car is on track. So that's the Surtees, and they're now all going to bunch up behind. Yeah, so okay. the safety car is on track, it's on the timing screens, there it is on the road, it's on the graphics, it's on the board, so they'll and, all now bunch up. And actually, if we'd had a restart, as we were just talking about a second ago, we could have probably had another melee somewhere yeah, around some yeah, of the parts yeah. of the So now, as a safety car restart, everybody will be in line astern. Hopefully, hopefully, it'll be a clean start on this restart just one hour we've got 44 minutes yeah. to go how many laps have we had of racing look again Fred Rebeach doing nothing wrong on the outside he has to wait to come in but David Perel is up on the inside he didn't need to do that he could have backed out of it and, and okay he might have had to concede but there's no point in keeping your foot in it and then ending up in a situation but where is the Ferrari he didn't really have much damage that we have seen to the 333 did it no I think he got away with that because once they he did. sort of he's shuffled got, he's got out of the way, he's gone. He's gone, yeah. yeah. And actually also quite lucky, the Mercedes, look, Jim Farr, he's got them spinning all around him, but he picked his way through. So just to recap, the full course yellow is deployed because instantly people slow down. For the restart, put the safety car out, bunch them up. It's a safer way of restarting. We're on board in replay with Bertolini. That's for Vich. Which way do I go? This way? Have I missed him? No! He could be. Andrea Bertolini was just... He was, a, he was a victim. Absolutely. What are you going to do? You can't anticipate when a car spins that automatically then the energy just... It'll shoot, shoot it straight back across the track. 
So down they come into Clark Curve, and Alain Ardon, the race director, as you have seen, has called for the safety car, which means that they all go one behind the other, and it will be, in theory, a safer restart. So there is David Perel. Now, at the Pro-Am opposition um, is either in the bin or behind him. He leads the class. He's got Jim Pla behind him, but the uh, car may well be investigated. The whole incident, I suspect, will be looked at by Greg Masters and his stewarding team. Yes, I mean, we saw what kicked it all off. It's a question of whether the apportionment of blame would be with Fred Verbeek to try to cut back in again, or David Perel for being a little hard-nosed about it and saying, I'm not going to concede ground to you. you. You made your bed, you lie in your bed, I'm on the inside of the track, it's my bit of territory. Safety car in at the end of this lap. We're going to go back racing. And there you see still the bits of Ferrari stuck in the Lamborghini. And I'm surprised that hasn't been required to come in because that's going to fly off and these cars get up to race speed that's going to go skyward somewhere around the racetrack it's quite impressive the fact that it's actually lodged in there i mean you know the, the yeah, chances of being able to do that are amazing yeah but uh, well, the energy involved the forces involved are considerable but yeah. you know the cars are running around currently at 50 miles an hour 80 kilometers per hour behind the safety car but these cars get up to 150 or 160 as they may do going down into hawthorne Penn. that's a different level of air pressure totally right well, it might be chilly, time for an ice cream, and then time to go racing then, as the cars... And what the two are lagging back a little bit, Christopher Meese, I would have thought, would be on his toes to try and gain ground. Amazingly enough, Frank Stiffler, who I thought was off the road in all of that, has gained places. He's 14th, he managed to luck into being in the right place at the right time. The safety car in this time will be back racing, and of course we're not that far away now, only six minutes or so from the pit window opening, so... It's going to be more drama when we get to the pit stops. Well, that means everybody's still going to be relatively bunched together when the pit stop window opens, which is not normally the case. Lights out, the top of the safety car. So just to recap, Fabian Schiller leads, Nick Foster is second, Mara Engel is third, Schiller has slowed them right down, and now he will decide when is the moment to start accelerating, and once you start, you've got to keep on accelerating. You can't go and slow because of the concertina effects and the danger behind. So Schiller has got the number 90 Mercedes with a good restart. Yes, he did it. everything he needed to do, had control. He made the run just coming down into Clark Curve, got on it, everybody behind has to wait until Schiller makes that move before they can respond and react. People are still moving around the racetrack a little bit to try and generate a bit more tyre temperature because running at ambient is cold at the minute, track temperature equally cold, tyre pressure temperatures drop away in these conditions, so they want to get back up to those racing temperatures. So where's the next change going to come from? Let's see there, look, number two, Christopher Meese. Uh, Fred Verviche is behind him, and Verviche, amazingly enough, is still on the lead lap despite that pit stop. Uh, came in for a new tyre, and there behind is Christopher Hassan, who is on the lead lap as well, despite the pit stop to tape up the door and everything else. So, those two cars, astonishingly enough, are still going. Proves how strong the Audis are, doesn't it? There, flashing the lights, Mario Engel going after Nick Foster. They're all jinking about to get the tyre temperatures up, the tyre pressures up into Hawthorne's again. This is lap 11. So Mario Engel been flashing the lights. For what purpose? I have no <laughs> idea. Obviously, he feels he's quicker than Nick Foster. He wants to get up to second base. He wants to have a chance to have a pop at Fabian Schiller before they all make their way. Five minutes to go now before pit stop window opens. The racing in the front has stretched out. The racing in the mid and tail of the field is absolutely as closely punched as it was, really, when they were still under the safety car. Absolutely right. So Fabian Schiller leading the way. Down they come in towards clearways. Pack breaking up in the midpoint there, but the leading Mercedes is that of Schiller. Foster. Triple three, causing a collision. There we are. That's the voice of Alain Adon that you heard giving a drive through penalty to triple three. David Perel for causing a collision. As there, look, Florian Schultz is about to go in place down because up comes Fred Verbeesch, up comes Christopher Hauser. They are two pro drivers. Schultz holds his hands up, says, I'm an amp. I'm not going to get in your way. You go for it. I mean, Fabian, I'm sorry, Frederick Verbeesch's tyres must be like 70 bits. Yes. I mean, when he spun, the amount of tyres book came off. So goodness knows what those tyres will be. I mean, he's going to have to baby it until he can get into the pit lane with just now four minutes. He must be one of, I'm sure, will be one of the first of the cars to make that, because these tyres will be not in great condition. So David Perel is currently in 11th place, leading pro out, but will now serve this drive-through penalty for causing that collision. It was an avoidable issue, in spite of Fred Babiche coming from left to right to try and consolidate what he attempted to do was make an overtake. But I, I, as I said at the time, I think that uh, David Perel could have been more generous and thoughtful and not force the issue and not actually drive into the side. It would appear to me to be driven into the side of Frederick Babiche's Audi.
from the consequences we've seen. As there goes 66, which is Clement Schmidt. He's in eighth place at the moment, up towards Sterling's. Turns left, back onto the power. And there, still with the bits of Ferrari stuck in the front of the Lamborghini, Christian Engelhardt, who is in 13th place, still with work to do in this very quirky grid, very quirky outcome to the race that we've had thus far. 38 minutes to go, so two laps for some and the window will be open. This race, aside from Fabian Schiller, who seems to have got control, and he'll be handing the car over to very shortly to Timo Bergeslowski, Everybody else, it can be won or lost in the pit lane, and the teams that are quick at turning around, and we saw how good at ACA ASP were in turning around the 89 car, Nico Bastian, to get that car to the, to the lead with Thomas Neubauer, and that you take victory. So it'll be, a, it'll be as much about a race and turning the, your driver car pairings around as it is what's going on track. A moment ago, you saw Dries Vantor uh, walking in, out of the race, and Fabian Schiller is under investigation for possibly speeding under the full course yellow. So the leading car is under investigation. He's just got to keep going. He can do nothing more than that. Just do what he's been doing all the way through. He's got a 1.6 second advantage over Nick Foster in second place. Maro Engel is preparing because that car... No, wait, that's not Maro Engel, it's... Um, Lucas Stoltz. Lucas Stoltz, yeah. I should say. Lucas Stoltz is preparing because uh, Maro Engel is currently in third place. He's 1.8 seconds behind the lead, but only two tenths of a second behind Nick Foster. He would like to get that pass done. There we are on board. There's the Audi directly ahead in Sterling's. So exit out of Sterling's, our leader, Fabian Schiller. And he's getting away. Nick Foster second, Maro Engel third, Raffaele Marchiello in fourth place. Marchiello not marching forward in the way that you might have anticipated, nor is Engel against Foster. And Fabian Schiller, that full-course yellow possible infringement aside, doing a good job up front because he's building the gap to two seconds now as they go over the line. And in the course of doing that, he's just set the fastest race lap on that last lap. Indeed so. Fifth is Kirchhofer, sixth is Neubauer, and there, look, five, six, three, that's Marco Mappelli getting on the back now, Clement Schmidt for eighth and ninth places. Drive through penalty to car 63 causing a collision with car 519 during the full course yellow procedure. So that is Christian Engelhardt being given a drive-through for causing a collision with Phil Keane under full course yellow conditions. Not a good idea. No. I've been mean, doing it on race conditions, you might have gotten away with it, but not under a safety car circumstance. There's Dries Van Thor and his head held very low all weekend. It's never worked for the number one Audi at all, and that's a car any time Dries Van Thor is in a car, it normally is starting at the front and it normally is running at the front. Of course, he's got a new co-driver, hasn't he, this year, in Ezekiel perez Compan, who we know is quick from his days in Lamborghinis, but that partnership has not yet gelled as Lucas Stoltz gets ready, and he knows that he's got a hard task now because very, very wide, wide there goes the second yeah. place, Nick Foster. Is he back on? He is. Has he kept second place? He has, amazingly. But, but, under pressure, coming down, under Sterling's, is Nick Foster about to go into the pit lane? No, he's not. But Maro Engel all over. I think Nick Foster is he? No, he's not. I thought he might have done. Nick Foster is under real pressure, not for one, but two Mercedes. So, an error made by Foster, and that brings Engel and Marchiello right onto his tail up towards Paddock. They go. Fabian Schiller is away now, three and a half seconds up the road. Nick Foster heading the Audi assault for a tempo is second, and they're all ganging up on him. He's the cork in the bottle at the moment. As Marchiello thinks about having a sniff at Engel, the pit window is open, so they can dive in at the end of this lap. And again, Foster all ragged, all up the curb at Druids. He's under pressure and he's driving as best he can. He's doing everything that that Audi is allowing him to do, and it has seen in this last lap and a bit a couple of errors. Maro Engel is able to take that tighter line, but on the exit, that Audi has got the drive. Took that wider entry, gave him the straighter exit, so get the power on fractionally earlier. You'd see that the gap has opened up again, slightly, well, maybe a couple of tenths of a second as they come down the hill into Hawthorne's yet again on that five. The short oh, that, run between sorry, 15, not five, yes, 15. that 15. And up front, Schiller by three and a half seconds, he's away and gone. Nick Foster trying to regroup, calm himself down, get on with life. So there is the leading car. No more news about this investigation for the full course yellow procedure. When we know more, we'll tell you. The teams are getting ready. So remember, they changed drivers and they changed four tyres. And look, it's like the school sports day. Everybody limbering up down there. So I am anticipating Fredrik Verbeesch will be the first in. And maybe I'm wrong, but we know that car has that massive spin. Angle is in. Marchiello, I think, is in as well. So here they come, the Mercedes, nose and tail down the pit road. Have a look at me, Kirchhoff, for his exit. Yeah, well, six cars now yeah. in the pit lane. So, Maro Engel, the, this pit stop will big or break. We've got the four in, we've got the 88 in. So, it's going to be a battle between the two different Mercedes teams. Who's the quicker in the pit stop? The 88 looks like it's going 
pretty well the four likewise the Fulcan team they thought they could maybe do a little bit better than they did the Aka ASP were the quickest in the first race this morning wheel off wheel on Away goes 88. 88, so that now is Vincent Abril. Away goes number four. No loss or no gain. No, they stay in the same order. So you've got then Stoltz ahead of Abril. Calderelli has jumped ahead, I reckon, in the Lamborghini look, and Marvin Kirchhofer down the pit lane. So 5-6-3, Marco Mappelli. I know he was ahead of the uh, Aston when they came in, apologies. So I think that's just about restored. But Mappelli then gets out swiftly, and Fabian Schiller going a long way because in that car he is quicker than co driver Timo Bogoslavski. Yeah, and he's going to stay out certainly another six minutes before we hand over to the young Russian teammate and give him the best opportunity. Currently, Fabian Schiller still consistently the quickest car on the track. Last lap one, 25.5. We need to see what his last lap as he comes across the line. 127.5.7, so two tenths down on that last lap. So he's losing fractionally. The, wish, the issue will be those that have put on fresh, in some cases new rubber, will be able to eat into that pace that the leading uh, Mercedes is setting. So you're looking at the pit stop there for the uh, winning car from the earlier race, Thomas Neubauer giving way to Nico Bastian. Just a quick correction has been offered up by the race officials. The drive through for Engelhardt, the collision with Phil Keane was under green, not full course yellow. I wasn't querying that in my mind, but anyway, they've uh, corrected it on the screen now to say it was under green flag conditions just before the full course yellow period. Either way, it's a drive through for Engelhardt, come what may. And there, the position. sting down the pit lane, yeah, 55. Nick Foster stays ahead of 89. As over the line now then goes the number four and 88 Mercedes. So Nick Foster giving the car over to Stein Scott Hall yes. lost out on the pit stops. Yeah, I, mean, but, but I just want to see whether Stein Scott, he, he's made it through Pedicle Ben, so he'll be happy about that. 76 Aston all over the back of the 89 Mercedes, which is just literally driven out of the pit lane, tires not up to full working temperature. This is the time if you think you're going to try and make a pass, stick to do it when the car you want to pass is just fresh out of the pits. So Fabian Schiller stays out for another lap, as we've been saying, trying to build this margin over the opposition. Through they come. And Fabian Schiller with this, what looks like, enormous advantage because all the people that have been racing against him have now pitted, so they've lost time as a consequence. So Schiller now has got to treat this like a qualifying session. He's done the fastest lap anyway. Goes into Druids. His last lap was an improvement on the previous or whatever, maybe just getting through something or traffic or one little issue, but back again. Uh, 25.3, which contrasts to his best lap of a 24, so he's just four tenths of a second away from his best lap when the tyres were younger and therefore fresher. So it's a strong run from Fabian Schiller right now. It's looking good, isn't it? But Luca Stoltz on his out lap, uh, first flying lap rather, has just done an absolute best, but then that is bettered by Calvin van der Linde yep. in number 66, who's done two absolute bests in the car that he uh, now has in 16th place. So van der Linde hustling his way up the order, having taken over from Clement Schmidt. So Schiller goes through for another lap. And the best of those that have made a pit stop at the moment is going to be, what, Luca Stoltz? It is. Luca Stoltz currently in eighth place, but just set the fastest race lap in the process. Calvin van der Linde, to make a pardon, still has got that 24.2. The lap that we saw from Luke Stoltz was at 24.4. Right, there back into the race comes 63. So that's the now way, way down in 19th Mirko Bortolotti driven car. It was Engelhardt that did the crime, but Bortolotti uh, has to pay the penalty in his stint. Through has just gone Fabian Schiller. That lap was a 25.3. Drive through penalty to car 90. Speeding 94.1 instead of 80 during the full course zero procedure. Well, there you heard it. The race leader gets a drive through penalty for speeding by what 14 kilometers an hour under the full course yellow procedure. Well, Gov, I have to put my hand up and say, I'm innocent. I can't. If it'd been one or two miles or kilometers an hour, you might think there's a fudge factor, but 14 is, well, that's a lot, and normally you'd say that's not something maybe it took me the driver responsibility. There are controls within the car that allow the car to run at precisely or a kilometre below that mandatory speed limit, and Fabian Schiller or the team have been caught out, so that's a big disappointment from the 90 car. So they've got to serve the drive through and, and the mandatory pit stop. Correct, they make the mandatory pit stop, but the trouble is, can they make the mandatory pit stop before the pit stop window, window closes? He's got only three, two minutes and, uh, well, just over two and a half minutes to do it. Well, get the driver change done first, because that's a regulation that you've got to do 
and then you can worry about the drive-through on the next lap, can't you? Because that doesn't have a window for it. No, I just, I just wasn't sure whether the, it had to be carried out before the pit stop window closed. So I just wasn't sure that whether one could be done before the other or not. So let's see what they do. The car's in, but I would imagine they need to get the driver changed up because you're right. If you did the drive-through yes. first, the danger is you overrun, overrun the window. Yeah. You don't get the driver yeah. change. Yeah. Whereas by this way, they can get it yeah. precisely so. So it's going to be another pit stop or another oh, sorry, a pit stop and a drive-through. Yeah, that's so it. So the lead is going to now go to. Let's see. It should be Malandundri. So Lucas Stolt potentially as the driver change and tyre change goes on and. The penalty will be communicated now to Timo Bogoslavski to say, right, we've given you the leading car, but you're going to come and see us again in a lap's time. So here is Lucas Stoltz, and he's on his own at the moment. He's managed to build a gap over Vincent Abril. Andrea Caldarelli is next. And although that Mercedes is serving the pit stop, it's kind of irrelevant now because of this extra stop the drive through it's going to have to make. So Stoltz is the leader. He comes up to cross the timing line now. Number four Mercedes goes through. And then for second place behind him, Vincent Abril, the gap is 2.4 seconds between them. Yeah, and I have to say, at the minute, Lucas Stoltz first or last flying lap, 24.6. The last flying lap for Vincent Abril, 24.8. Two tenths of a second, not a huge amount of difference, but it's going the way of the number four Black Falcon Mercedes rather than the way of the 88 uh, ASP. And Fabian Schiller, stint done walks away so he's got the message and he's not really in the mood to stop the chance is he would anybody i mean the, the, i'm sure he is he's not aware that he had exceeded the speed limit that's whether it was a technical fault or a miscommunication but whatever he's not going to talk to anyone so that car that's in the silver cup we'll wait to see what its class position is going to be late race as there the lead gap it was 2.4 seconds at the start of this lap. It's Lucas Stoltz in the all-blue Black Falcon run car. The head of Vincent Abril's blue and white livery car. And in the first sector, Stoltz getting away. Yes, I think that the Black Falcon car currently, whether it's because of the just the, the setup of the car or whether it's because of the driver lineup in that number four car, is a very strong lineup. The lineup in the 88 is a, a fresh lineup. That's in the Abril behind the wheel of the 88. First time this year in the Mercedes AMG ASP, whatever, whatever. So consistency and continuity in the number four and bedding in for the 88. Lucas Stoltz, absolute best in the first sector. There is the 333 Ferrari, David Parrell, which has fallen back to third now in the Pro-Am contest. And David Parrell gives it over to Renat Salikov. And the pit window is about to close in just over 40 seconds. And Lucas Stoltz still pursuing past the sector times as is, in fact, Andrea Caldarelli, who's found himself. He's, Andrea Caldarelli is now up in fifth place, and he's just, what, a one and a half seconds behind Vincent Abril. So yeah. Vincent Abril should begin to worry because the pace of Caldarelli is uh, impressive. And that's third in real terms, isn't it? Because the two ahead have yet to pit. Uh, we've also yet to serve the drive-through for number 90. So there is 87 Jim Clark. In he comes, and Phil Key is in behind him, so the window is about to close. Look, four seconds, three, two, they've just made it in in time before the window closes. So those cars serve the stops. They were notionally first and second in the race. So it's now Stoltz, Avril, Candere, Caldarelli, Scott Horst, Bastian, Collard, the top six. And we've still got to have this drive-through penalty served by Bogoslavski. He's not yet served the drive-through. Well, there is our race leader, Lucas Stoltz. Gap between second place, Vance and Abril is 2.8 seconds and stretching. Yeah, it is, isn't it? So Stoltz goes over the line. The car in this race having what it didn't have in race one, seemingly that pace. Now let's see the lap times of Calderelli. He's 4.7 seconds off the race leader. His last lap was a 24.8, 24.4 for the leader. He's actually not catching Abril. He was a tenth slower on that last lap through. So the gap has gone up from 1.4 to 1.5 seconds. Let's give it another couple of laps and see whether the 563, the Lamborghini, can shut down the number 88 Mercedes. It's going to be a difficult task. We've just now got 24 minutes of this race remaining, and things are a little bit more stable than they were, certainly in the, the heady days of the opening laps. Keeping an eye to Bogoslavski, who is up into eighth place overall, but he's still not done the drive-through. It's on the screens. The team can see it, but as yet, the penalty has not been taken. Well, I, as I imagine, as was the case this morning, when uh, the Andrea Caldarelli's car was penalised, the team went up and discussed it with race director. They were given a short shrift. 
I would imagine, I suspect maybe, that's the same with the ACA ASP, they may be up saying, well, what, we don't know, don't tell us the story, is it, did we actually create, a, did we do something wrong? Well, speeding, and the, infamous, the, the data is there, you can't really argue with it, but as yet the penalty not taken, and of course when it does come in, it'll drop down the order. So, you're riding with Nico Bastian, he is in fifth place, that's Stein Cockles just up the road ahead of him, in the car that Nick Foster started, and this is the Silver Cup leading car, Remember, it won outright in race one, Bastian and Neubauer. And now Bastian is going after Scott Horst, 0.476 of a second, going into Paddock. I mean, he's doing it because he can do it, he's got the pace. The danger is he doesn't want to throw away championship points because he is leading the Silver Cup right now. So if he gets himself entangled in something with, with, the, with the idea, that would not be a great idea. So it's about prudence. Next challenger is, well, is the, is the 90 Mercedes in the Silver Cup that, as you point out, David, has got to make that pit stop. So there is the race leader, Lukas Stoltz. So, race order, number four, the Black Falcon Mercedes, that's the leading car. Gap back, three and a half seconds to second place. There, Vincent Abril, 1.6 seconds back, Calderelli. Another gap back, fourth, Scott Horst, fifth, Bastien. Sixth, Collard, seventh now is van der Linde, eighth is Bogoslavski. A bigger gap, here's the... Ninth place car, Charles Viet going through, and in 10th place, Simon Gachet. The next gap takes you to Milan Dodger, who is in 11th place. 12th is Iro Vainio, and behind him, 13th is Kim Louis Schramm. 14th is the blue Audi of Finley Hutchison, the one that had its big spin here earlier in the race in the hands of Fred Verviche. And then behind him, 63, Mirko Bortolotti. The weekend, certainly as far as this race is concerned, has got no better. Well, it's been, I mean, they had, had a shunt, and qualifying, so that really put them on the back foot, everything that they were doing, but it was the incident in the first race with Christian Engelhardt that uh, led to, the, sort of the, in a sense, the downfall of their yeah. race part of the weekend. Well, Lucas Stoltz right now is looking very strong, isn't he? Four seconds, it was 2.4 at the start, really, of this stint, and he's building the gap all the time, runs a little bit wide, though, coming out of Graham Hill Bend, all four wheels the wrong side of the white line, into Surtees he goes now, as far as the Silver Cup is concerned, it's Bastian from Boguslavski. penalty for car 90, suspended, it will be investigated at the end of the race. And there's the information from the race director, the drive through suspended, so the discussion has come as you were suggesting. Exactly, what I thought had happened is that there's been a discussion between the team and uh, race control, and they've decided to withhold the suspension, and that's what teams do, they get a, a, an advice that there's a penalty, and they rush up immediately and knock the door down yes. to say, we're not guilty of a gun, you know, look me up, anyway. So I think that is probably a good decision, but of course, it means that the 90 Mercedes currently running in eighth place, second in the Silver Cup. Prospect of it actually making any ground up to the leading Silver Cup car, well, that's what, what, seven seconds, seven and a half seconds away, eight seconds. So they'll, they'll look at it at the end of the race. If they still think the team is guilty, then it'll become a 30-second penalty to add to the time. Obviously, you can't do the drive-through post-race, so it's 30 seconds added. Stein Scotthorst then goes through, running in fourth place, and he is being chased hard by Nico Bastian, and then behind them is Ricky Collard going great guns in the Aston Martin. But Bastian, after a good start to the day, a win in race one, outright with Neubauer, looking for two from two within the Silver Cup here. That car running currently fifth overall. Well, that's the key, that's what they're after, there's that double win in the Silver Cup. And uh, it's very lovely to win the race, but it doesn't actually add... You can't do more than win your own category. There's no extra points in terms of Silver Cup. But look, right onto the rear of the Audi in through Surtees. And Stein Stornot, Stein Scotthorst has got to really, really be aware that one little mistake, one little run wide, one little picking up a bit of curb on the exit of a corner, and the 89 Mercedes is going to be through. So out of Hawthorne's on towards Westfield they go, Nico Bastien adding the pressure to Stein Scott Horst in this car that, of course, was damaged badly in race one. It's a Herculean task to put it onto the grid. Up through Sheen Curve, it will come now. We're on lap 25 and we've got 19 minutes to go. Ricky Collard in the background in sixth place, not quite staying on the back. The Aston Martins have, to use a phrase, been there or thereabouts this weekend, but not quite have perhaps the outright no, pace. No, they're, 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 they reckon the car is good in the high speed corners. In the lower speed corners, they feel that the idea of the Lamborghinis are a little bit quicker. Just on the subject of, of Stein Shorthorse, the, the, the car in the effort to get it ready, the steering is actually slightly out, which isn't a big issue, but it is for a driver because you want that steering wheel to be absolutely spot in the middle. So that was one of the things, one of the details they 
weren't able to get to, and that would be a suspension geometry issue, but steering two R, maybe, for example. So, Scott Horst and Nick Foster doing a good job keeping the car up there, keeping it competitive. The leading gap is up to five seconds now. Strange that the Africa car of Abril and Marchiello, and we know how good they both are, has never really come alive. I think second place is hardly a bad result, but it's not been quite as sharp as anticipated. It's not been really, really at the level we have seen, certainly over the last two seasons. And I'm up to say, I mean, Raffaele Marcello is almost the class of the field of the, the Mercedes drivers in general. And even he hasn't had that shown that sparkle that we normally expect from him. So there looks Stein Scott Horst under attack, bouncing over the curb, that Nico Basti, yeah, that rattles your feelings, doesn't it? Yeah, so this whole ratcheting, those bumps and get into a sort of vertical movement up and down, and of course that's re catching, releasing, catching, releasing grip all the time. But in the pursuit, it's allowing Ricky Collard, who is in the Aston, and probably not in overall terms as fast as the, certainly the Mercedes, but the Mercedes is being backed up by short shots. I even said short scorners. Short horse. So he's fourth at the moment, is Scott Horse. There he is over the line. Nico Bastian going after him. That lap from the Audi was a 26-3 and a 26-1 from Bastian. So he's a little bit quicker, but again, he can catch possibly, but where, if at all, can he find a way by? Interesting, the gap between first and second has now virtually doubled us up to 6.2 seconds. So right. Lucas Stoltz is up on guard, and Vance and Abril can do nothing about it. And he has got now, within just a second, he's got Andrea Caldarelli in the third position in the Lamborghini. So 55, remember, Stein Scotthorst, who was taking over the second place car as it was before the pit stops, down in fourth. The car we know is not Oquan, but it was a 47 second stop, whereas it was 44 seconds from Stoltz, 45 from Avril, and 43 for Calderelli. So relatively, it was a slow stop from a tempo that's cost them ground. Uh, well, that's the pit lane, as I did say, would be maybe the, the, the element that would win and lose, or certainly gain you or lose you track position. So all the work you do before the pit stop can be in immediately compromised by not turning the car around. Nick Bastian driving the wheels off his 89 Mercedes. Ricky Collar doing a super job directly behind in the 76 Aston Martin. And this is allowing Kelvin van der Linde and the 90 Mercedes of Berkulowski to all join in effectively. And also, Calderelli in second place is still going after Vincent Abril. Replay here at Paddock Hill Bend of Aro Vagno getting it slightly wrong, and he runs out wide through the dirt, and that means that up the inside goes Kim Louis Schramm. Yeah, that's the kind of pass you want. That's an easy pass. Driver runs wide, catches the gravel, and the car directly behind you gets the run up the hill, gets alongside before you even get into the braking zone, takes control of the corner, and then uh, moves forward. And a problem, I think, for Abril. I've just seen the car go very slowly along Cooper Straits, and I've got a horrible feeling, 88 is crawling. Let's see, there it is. Vincent Abril slows right down and out of the race from second place goes the Mercedes. Wow, what a shock that is. Can't see anything that's obvious. Uh, normally, if there's a tyre that would gone down or a puncture or something, picking up a bit of carbon fibre, then you normally try to drive the car back. But it looks like all four wheels and tyres are normal. So that is some form of mechanical or maybe electronic. Could be hydraulic, but mostly mechanical or electronic. I was getting excited a lap or so ago, saying the gap was coming down. And never. Calderani. Well, now we know why, because the car must have had a problem. So the car definitely dropped back in the last three or four laps from that three and a half second event, our, our deficit. To, but what now going across the line was a seven second death, but that allowed Calderelli and that last couple of laps to get in within almost half a second. And look, that's an Abril, he always wears his heart on his shoulder, and yeah. there again, the emotion of losing a guaranteed second place podium position. More importantly, taking the challenge to the number four leading Mercedes, the Black Focus car. Marshall's main concern is get in it, we need to push you off the circuit. Never mind the fact that he's just had a good result snatched away. Raffaele Marchiello being fairly sanguine about it. Yeah, and pretty passive looking. Yeah, hopefully we'll be able to find out what's happened to that car, but big, big disappointment as it's pushed away. Well, an unexpected retirement because that car has been pretty much bulletproof. The only time it retires is when the driver actually is the guilty party and just trashes it at some point. Indeed so, it's a rare failure. Well, we're saying the car hadn't been looking sharp. There's a drive-through penalty for number five, Kim Lewis Schramm, for being short on the pit stop in the Pro-Am class car. So on board now with the Mercedes hustling on still. Nico Bastian hard at work. 
So this could be the battle for the last podium position. The gap between first and second is eight seconds, so that's not going to be a battle. But battle for third place is covered by less than half a second. You can see it. You can almost count it. So through they turn. Also, Nico Bastian's car is under investigation for a full course yellow issue. So you're riding with Nico Bastian, but he's under investigation for the uh, full course yellow. Something might be there. Raffaele Marchiello does not yet know what's happened to the car. We have posed a question in the pits, but he doesn't yet know, so we'll try and keep lobbying and find out, because we all want to know. Well, normally I would expect fans of the Brill to get on the radio and say, guys, the car's stopped or yeah. something's failed. Maybe he didn't get to do that. Maybe there is no electricity in the car. Don't let him do it in the first place. Could well be. Well, he hasn't gone far to walk back, sadly. He's out of the race, but he'll get to the pit lane shortly. Fabian Schiller, after his... Uh, potential transgression earlier on, we never heard from, but that was because he stalked away to the transporter, leaving Timo Bogoslavski uh, in seventh place. Serving the drive-through for a pit stop infringement at the moment is Kim Louis Schramm. And there, number four, Lucas Stoltz, just dominant. Nine seconds clear of that man, Andrea Caldarelli, as they accelerate out of Hawthorne along the short straight up towards Westfield now. We have got 12 minutes of the race to go. And when you think of all the problems that the Lamborghini team has hit, Andrea Caldarelli, that incident, in the first race into turn one, and uh, here they are, potential podium finishers, albeit they're going to be nine seconds or more behind, but the fact is they're safe in that second place. The third place Audi and the fourth place Mercedes are a further, well, just five and a bit seconds directly behind. I understand that the reason that the Fabian Schiller speeding is under investigation was because the safety car board came out while the full course yellow uh, procedure was still there. So seeing the safety car, he accelerated to catch it. And that is why there was that possible overspeeding, a sudden burst of acceleration to catch up to the safety car, because then, of course, you're not at the 80 kilometers as you're at whatever speed the safety car is going at. So that's why they're looking at it. Yeah, I suspect as a consequence, if that is the case, then they'll probably give them a buy. But nevertheless, it's a, it's a penalty. It still could be applied as we continue to watch this battle between third and fourth place gap, three tenths of a second. You can't get any closer, really. If you are, you're going to be touching the rear of the ID. So Stolz to Calderalli, 8.9 seconds. Nico Bastian, fourth, still heading for a Silver Cup win because he's clear of Timo Bogoslavski, irrespective of whatever penalty may or may not count for that car. And then third is Milan Doncha in number 56, the car that he shares with Matteo Drudi. So they're all bunching up again here, which is for now third, fourth, fifth and sixth with the demise of 88 Mercedes. Up the hill they come. Nico Bastian, mindful that Ricky Collard there is getting a little bit nearer to him. On board with Collard now. The Aston Martin down to second gear into Sterling. Back on the power. Yeah, I think this is the, the, the pace of the Aston. If Bastian could get ahead of the ID then, I don't think he'd be able to follow through. So uh, Nick, uh, Ricky would be sort of in the position that now Nico Bastian's in, but probably with less opportunity to make a, a, a solid pass. Over the timing line, Collard then running in fifth spot, goes up towards Paddock, but again, he's not quite able to get near enough to Nico Bastian, and even if he can, where does he find the width of track to find the way by? Bogoslavski in seventh is joining in this queue of cars. We're into the last ten minutes now as they round Druids. But up front, Lucas Stoltz, nine and a half seconds ahead of Andrea Caldarelli. It's been a good day for Mercedes, hasn't it? And by the end of it, it's going to be a winner piece for Acker Drive and Black Falcon. Car 89 overtaking and the full course yellow procedure. Nico Bastian, a drive-through oh. penalty for overtaking on the full course yellow. Oh, unbelievable. I can't believe the number of offences that have been occurring you know, throughout both these events. And, I mean, the drivers, they get a briefing before the event. They know the rules and regulations, what you're permitted to do and not permitted to do. And he's almost, almost at a position where he's going to take away that third place from Stein Skrothorz. And so that's going to also cost them the Silver Cup win because Bogovlaski, look, he's only three cars back in the queue. He's going to luck into the class oh, lead. A dead cert, an absolute dead cert. There's Ricky Collard going through. Well, are we done yet? Because we've uh, still got drama. The fastest pit stop in the pit stop challenge has come from the team of number two WRT. Perhaps that's no surprise. WRT has always been red hot on pit stops. That's the Mies and uh, Broker's car, uh, Viet's car, isn't it? Number two. Right, up towards the timing line, Lucas Stoltz has gone by. We wait, we wait, we wait for anybody to be second. Ten seconds back is Calderelli. The gap's just widening all the time. I mean, Andrea doesn't have to do any more. He could just sit back and cruise because the third place already is short, also it's going to be about 5.2 seconds behind. 
We've got eight minutes to go. The right wheel of him catching up to the second place when his mirrors are full of Mercedes, Aston Martin and Audi. Ain't going to be a problem as far as I can see. So downhill tumbles now. Stein Scott Horst. So Nico Bastiani still chasing, but he's going to have to serve this drive through penalties. That's going to well, are they going to go up and do the same thing? They're going to go up and discuss it and say, well, you know, show us the proof, give us the evidence. We know we're not going to bring this guy in, potentially throw away a silver cup prize if there is some uncertainty. So that's going to be another, I suspect, knock on the door of race director and say, please, God, we're not guilty. Yeah, might be. And Lando has had it explained that once the message was up on the timing screen, that was it. Well, let's have a look, let's see whether we can confirm or deny what he did. So, full course yellow, there are the yellow flags. And look, he's up the kerb, the yellow flags are waving, which means no overtaking anyway. And boom, guilty. Yeah, guilty as charged, absolutely. Yeah, so, go and argue if you want, but, but you can no, get short shrift. It's weird, I mean, why would a guy like Nick Bastion, who knows the book inside out, make a pass on a car under a yellow flag circumstance and they think he's going to get away with it? Well, I won't. suppose that's what makes him a racing driver. Always the competitive there, I suppose. But yeah, he's got the penalty, he's going to have to take it, but he's not taken it yet. And if you don't do it within three passings since the message came up on the screen, then you get in really hot water. So, this race that's had drama, drama and drama still has more to offer up. And Lukas Stoltz on a serene Sunday afternoon drive, 10 seconds clear up front. And is that Vincent Abril back at Acker? Yeah, it looks like... And is like, he yet yes. speaking to people? I mean, eventually he's very emotional and anything that doesn't happen that's good it just all pours out so Stolt, Calderelli, Scott Horse, Bastian, Collard, Van der Linde is the top six and Bastian has another go but it's all futile because he's got to serve the drive through well he's doing what he's told to do stay out there until we tell you to come in true enough he's got the instruction from race director but the team will instruct him when to come in out of Hawthorne's late car along that short straight. And there is Vincent Abril, Jerome Polycon standing alongside him as the team patron. So Vincent and Jerome will know what's gone on, but uh, as yet, no one's talking. So through they turn, and there's 76. Ricky Collard in that fifth place. Stein's Scott is doing a very good job here. He's kept them all stacked up behind him, like the cork in the bottle, hasn't he? And he's yep. not put a wheel wrong. Collard goes a little bit wide there. Now he's done a good job under... Oh, oh a lot of tyre smoke. Is that tyre smoke or oil on the exhaust? I thought that was blue smoke out of well, the back of the Mercedes. It, that doesn't look good. No, it does not. And that's an Acker car, isn't it? Bogoslavski has his 88, so I wonder whether that's another possible mechanical drama. Bogoslavski is about to get gobbled up, I fear, as they come over the line, up past the pits they come. And so through turns Bogoslavski, then he's hanging on to seventh place, but Charles Viet is reeling him in. Through Druids goes then now the... 55, Steins Kockhorst, Audi, Collard is under attack from Kelvin van der Linde, fifth and sixth places, but there's more still to come in this race. And there, look, almost up the inside goes van der Linde. That was his chance, Collard just about got there in time to cover the line and fend him off. Right, let's find out what happened to Vincent Avril. He's out of the race, and Dakota has used her charms to get an answer. But Vincent, now what happened there? Yeah, we were comfortably in second. The guys did a great pit stop, but unfortunately, when I straight left from the pits, um, I had problems. I had drive problems, so um, we finally found it was the clutch. So every time I was going on power, I was losing quite a bit of time, and it got just worse and worse eventually. And then I just lost complete drive. So towards half of my stint, I was trying to be smooth and to go to the end, but there was no way. I was just hearing it getting worse and worse. And it's a shame we had a, we had a great start of the weekend. You know, we we're topping practice sessions, and then. Qualifying was a nightmare with weather, but we still did a decent job. And now uh, with the race, we finally some, saw some light, but yeah, it just doesn't want to smile. Really tough. Thanks, Vincent. OK, that tells you the story then. Vincent Abril out of the race with a clutch issue that then results in a loss of drive. And here in replay is the uh, move of a moment ago with diving up on the inside line. Ricky Collard on the outside line, Kelvin van der Linde. They were side by side through the corner. Van der Linde leaning on Collard again and again and again. And Ricky doesn't take things like that lying down. So he's back ahead when they get to Westfield and he's still ahead as they went over the timing line. But here, look, is the fight for third. Scott falls ahead of Bastian, who has still not taken that drive through penalty. We're not aware that it's been suspended. And Bastian is crawling over the back of the Audi here. Just under four minutes to go, and the team, you can see what they're trying to do, is keep him out to the end, but the danger is that by not responding to that penalty, Nico Bastian finds himself in deeper trouble. Through Hawthorne's they turn now. 
and 66. Kelvin van der Linde is getting a driving standards flag now, and probably for that contact against Collard. So um, the officials not taking kindly to what was almost a touring car move. And Ricky Collard did, of course, race in the BTCC at the back end of last year. And Calvin van der Linde's father was a uh, touring car racer in South Africa many moons ago as well, so you can kind of understand why it happened, perhaps. There is number two, which is the Audi now of Charles Veer, up into seventh place from near the back of the grid. They've just chipped away him and Christopher Mees in this race. Three minutes to go, we're going to get two more laps out of the race as there Vietz turns now into Clark Curve. And still, nothing in terms of the drive-through taken by Nico Bastia. Now, does that mean he's gone away, or is he just hoping that he can, and the team can, persuade people at the end of the race that he's not guilty of any misdemeanor? Well, we've seen it, but he's still not taken the penalty, have he? So, Sainz Kronholz is there in third, Nico Bastian crawling all over the back of him still. Nose to tail, they run. Switching sides, van der Linde makes his move on Collard. Excellent move this time. There's the gap on the inside, and Kelvin van der Linde comes charging by. Through he goes. And so, upper place, Kelvin van der Linde into fifth place. Now, rookie Collard on that basis, I'm afraid, had nothing in response. We're into the last two minutes of the race. Down towards clearways goes this fight, but the race leading car of a dominant Luca Stoltz will get two more laps out of the race. And now, finally, Bastian comes into the pit lane. So Nico Bastian comes into the pit lane to take that drive through. I suspect in part he's stayed out as long as he can to try and build the gap over Bogoslavski. But in he comes. So where will that drop him to? Charles Viet goes through. Simon Gachet comes through. And Bogoslavski has got problems. Remember we saw Blue Smoke a lap or two ago? Well, the Mercedes is limping into the pit lane. It's stopped at pit in. So their look is Nico Bastian back in the race. And he will keep the Pro-Am lead only just because Timo Bogoslavski's car is in a cloud of smoke at pit in. There, going through is the Audi now. Milan Doccia that goes second in the Silver Cup. But Bogoslavski has limped as far as pit in, and the car is smouldering away near Clark Curve. There it is, you can see in the background. Driver is okay and out of the car. Well, we saw blue smoke coming out of Sterling's a few laps back, and not a good day for Acker ASP. Another car with a mechanical problem, and this one is setting fire to the lawn. We've got 36 seconds to go, and Lukas Stoltz will get one more lap out of this race as he comes then down now through Clark Curve, you'll see the yellow flags, he'll back off, but for 27 seconds he's got to go around again. Here he comes. But Stoltz and Mauro Engel, dominant in an excellent day for Mercedes. So on to the last lap, he now goes. It's Andrea Caldarelli in second spot behind. The gap, though, has never looked likely to be coming down, but it's a better result, clearly, in this second race for the Lamborghini team. Stein Scott Horse is hanging on to third. Fourth is van der Linde then, fifth Collard and sixth is Viet, seventh is Gachet, eighth now is Bastien, ninth is Dodger and tenth is Bortolotti. So as the cars work this last lap of the race, Stoltz 11 seconds clear of Caldarelli, the Black Falcon team that felt it lacked a bit of pace in the earlier race here, doing an excellent pit stop, not the best, but a good one, and jumping ahead of the opposition. So it's the car of Andrea Caldarelli heads for second place. A far, far better result than in race one. It was a very good pit stop that brought that car into the mix as well. And coming out now of the right-hand report forms in third place, Stan Scotthorst, who's actually only three seconds back from Andrea Caldarelli. So Stan Scotthorst and Nick Foster in a car rebuilt after the race one accident. And, of course, with the steering not true, I've done a pretty decent job, it's got to be said. Last corner, last lap, and honours in the Blancpain GT World Challenge Europe. Race two at Brands Hatch will go the way of Black Falcon. The Mercedes of Mauro Engel and Luca Stoltz wins at Brands Hatch. A dominant display in the second stint by Luca Stoltz to come through to win. There's a delighted Mauro Engel there who will celebrate. Andrea Caldarelli comes through for second with Marco Mappelli. And third in the background, Stein Scotthorst and Nick Foster, just ahead of Kelvin van der Linde, along with 
Clement Schmidt. A very happy Mario Engel there starts the celebrations. Fifth goes the way of Ricky Collard and Marvin Kirchhofer. And in sixth place, Charles Viet. And here is 89. So to win the Silver Cup, Nico Bastien heads up now towards the timing line. Through he goes. So despite the penalty, it's still a Silver Cup win for the Mercedes. Pro-Am goes the way of Jean-Luc Bobelic and Jim Pla. And of course, the Ams won by the only entrance, the Ferrari of Wolfgang Triller and Florian Scholzer. But what a race. Drama all the way through, but in the end, such a dominant performance put in by Stoltz, Amaro Engel in that second stint, just no stopping them. Try as the opposition might, but with penalties, with damage, with drama. Uh, here in Pro-Am, actually the lead battle not yet resolved because up the inside comes Hiroshi Hamaguchi versus the Mercedes with Jean-Luc Mobley and Hamaguchi gets his nose in front and he's going to win it on the line. Through goes Hiroshi Hamaguchi racing at Brands for the first time and he wins on the line by 25 thousandths of a second. So Phil Keane and Hiroshi Hamaguchi win the Pro-Am contest just ahead of Bobelik and Jim Pla. Jean-Luc Bobelik losing out on the last corner of the last lap. So after an hour of racing, Hiroshi Hamaguchi welcome to Brands Hatch. Here's the move again, look, he got that slightly tighter line into Clark Curve. There was barely the width, but he's coming through, two wheels on the dirt. That, of course, forced Bobelik a little bit wide. Hiroshi Hamaguchi up the inside line, got his nose in front, just because the grunt of the Mercedes brought him back, 25 thousandths the margin. But there, Luca Stoltz clambers out of the car and Mauro Engel is the first one to go across and greet him and to say well done. The Black Falcon team, uh, Sean Breslin, Sean Paul Breslin, his father Sean Breslin used to race Renaults in one make championships in the UK. Uh, and uh, Sean himself, former racer, but has taken this German-based team to great success in initially things like the VLN based at the Nordschleife, but in recent years has come across into the Blancpain GT endurance event and now into sprints. In fact, really, it's the first time we've seen uh, the team doing such a good job in sprint races and, uh, and excellent efforts uh, early on. So uh, you heard after the first race, Lucas Stoltz saying we're new to sprints with next stands and maybe we're a bit cautious in the pit stops. And again, perhaps it was a decent but not stellar pit stop and they were looking at that for subsequent rounds. However, it's a win and a very happy Lucas Stoltz. There is Sean Breslin in the background. So it's well done to Lucas Stoltz. And uh, for second place, Andrea Caldarelli and Marco Mappelli, who will be there. But Mauro Engel and Lucas Schultz are the race winners. It's time we heard from those two victorious drivers with Watty. Marco, you're looking a little bit happier now. <laughs> yeah, obviously, a uh, great result for us. Um, a second and a win is, is a dream result. Awesome job by Luca, by the whole team, and uh, really proud of everyone. And uh, yeah, just really happy. Looked tough in the early laps, but you handed the car over to Luca. Brilliant pit stop once again. Yeah, absolutely. Big thanks to the team. Um, just a bit strange. I don't know. Maybe maybe Lello was uh, needed to go to the restroom or something. He was <laughs> coming fast under full course yellow. Um, that was a bit strange. But um, yeah, so maybe he was in a hurry there. But uh, in the end, yeah, it worked all worked perfectly and uh, really happy. Luca, you never saw anybody ahead of you other than when you were overtaking and lapping. No, actually it was a pretty lonely stint, yeah, but amazing effort by the team, they did a great pit stop. Uh, Mauro ended over the car in P3, we had new tyres for the, for the second stint, and then uh, could, could create a decent gap, and yeah, I just had to bring it to the end. They did a great job, two of you, well done. Thank you. So new tyres being the key to the success, Luca Stoltz and Mauro Engel, the winners. Uh, Stein, Scott Horst and Nick Foster, I think third at the end of that after the travails of the first race is a pretty decent result. Nick Foster we saw years ago racing Porsches in sports car racing, then he went to Ferrari, now at Audi. But Andrea Caldarelli and Marco Mappelli take second, they can tell all to John. Marco, great job by you. Do I call him the boss or not? Yeah, of course, always. He's the captain, so... <laughs> so you did a great first stint, good pit stop handed over to Andrea. Yeah, for sure. This is a team win because uh, when you have so much such a quick uh, pit stop with the guys, those first year in the Blancpain sprint uh, is for them, this uh, result, and uh, we will continue like this for sure. Andrea, you were a bit, put it mildly, wound up after the first race this morning. You look a lot happier now. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm still, uh, still wound up. Yes, I am. I am, especially after a few drivers' declaration. I don't like it, but anyway, uh, the team did a mega pit stop. Like, I don't know how, how quick we were, but uh, I think this, this uh, second place goes really to the team. As Marco said, 
we prepared so much during this winter. The guys, they, they were amazing. And uh, that this goal goes to the team. Well, it's great to see a great team effort from everyone. Well done. Thanks. So, Andrea Caldrari and Marco Mappelli for the Orange 1 FFF racing team, the Chinese-based team of uh, the squad that's reigning champions in Block Pan GT Series Asia. Meantime, Black Falcon are doing the group photograph celebrations. Lucas Stoltz, Sean Paul Breslin, and uh, Mario Engel in there as well. Now, what about the third place drivers? Stan Scotthorst and Nick Foster, uh, John has uh, managed to get to. And let's have a quick word from the third place Audi drivers right now. Nick, start of the race, you're getting a right old workout from the Mercedes lining up behind you. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I have to thank Attempto. Uh, we're lucky to get out at all after the uh, race one accident. So um, they worked their butts off and, and got the car it's hanging on by race tape and it wasn't pretty to drive, but you know, starting from the front row, you've got to push as hard as you can to get the car out there. So uh, Mauro was giving me a workout. I think I gave him a bit of a workout at turn one, but anyway, that's the way it goes. But you know, superstar drive from this guy to hang on to it at the end. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't real nice out there. That's for certain, but uh, we hung on for a podium, so it makes it all worth it. It's good for you. You're sort of driving into the unknown in a car that really had been barely, barely a race car. Yeah, well, I haven't turned a lap today. I haven't turned a lap since uh, one qualifying lap yesterday, so it was pretty interesting. And, uh, yeah, just stoked for the team, stoked for uh, Stein. It's awesome. You told me in the grid that the gravel that was dropping out of the car, you didn't have time to take it out of the bottom of it. Yeah, exactly. The car was, uh, was barely in one piece uh, when we got it to the grid, uh, but the team... Honestly, did a mega job getting it there. Um, wasn't in the best state, but it was good enough for a podium. And uh, because of that, this just feels like a win. Well, Nick was under pressure. You were under pressure all the way through as well. Yeah, yeah, we were a bit off the pace, obviously. The steering wheel was off and uh, and uh, it wasn't the fastest race car we've driven, but uh, it makes the, the podium extra sweet. Superhuman effort, guys. Well done. Yes. It was a great effort given the damage sustained earlier on in the day. So, although the incident, that change of place between Hamaguchi and Bobalik is under investigation, let's have a look at the provisional results. There are also other investigations going on, of course, but on the road, Stoltz and Engel. Lucas Stoltz and Mauro Engel, the winners from Andrea Caldarelli and Marco Mappelli, Stein Scottforst and Nick Foster third. Calvin van der Linde fourth with Clement Schmidt, ahead of Ricky Collard and Marvin Kirchhofer, and then sixth, Charles Viet and Christopher Meese, ahead of Simon Gachet and Christopher Hauser, who had to make a pit stop, remember. Eighth, Nico Bastian. Uh, and his co-driver Thomas Neubauer ahead of Milan Doncher and Matteo Drudi with Mirko Bortolotti and Christian Engelhardt who served a drive through as well, rounding out the top ten. Uh, so we had an awful lot of damage, an awful lot of penalty. Uh, the stewards are still busy because they've got things to review and things to analyse and uh, therefore the way that they've come across the line may not necessarily reflect uh, the final result. But assuming they do, this is how the Blockhand GT World Challenge Europe overall points uh, situation is with Mauro Engel and Lukas Stoltz with the two results they've had today leading the championship from Thomas Neubauer and Nico Bastian. Then Clement Schmidt and Calvin van der Linde ahead of Marco Mappelli and Andrea Calderelli. It's Engelhardt, Bortolotti next from Foster and Scott Corst after only one finish. Kirchhofer and Collard next from Raffaele Marchiello and Vincent Abril. Tom Gamble and Charles Viet come next with Christopher Meese and Shea Davis on the same number of points, of course, although a retirement in race two for Davis and Gamble hurting them. Hauser and Gachet are next ahead of Avish and Hutchison, Finley Hutchison, the Scottish driver, who, of course, took over the Audi, which uh, to see some of those Audis survive the accident early on was quite remarkable in itself. As far as the Silver Cup is concerned, Thomas Neubauer and Nico Bastian have already built a pretty healthy advantage there over Matteo Drudi and Milan Doncic, Fabian Schiller and Timo Bogoslavski third. It's Tom Gamble and Shea Davis uh, fourth ahead of Oscar Tunko and Rick Brokers. Then Hugo de Sadelier and Aro Vainio next with Taylor Proto and Diego Menchaca suffering, of course, because they only got into one race and didn't finish that either. So a uh, big disappointment for them with a limited haul of points from Brands Hatch. Well, there we've got the drivers making their way, sorry, not the drivers, the mechanics, I should say, making their way onto the podium because this is the pit stop challenge. Uh, and it was the WRT team that operates the number two Audi, that of Christopher Meese and Charles Viet, sixth in the race, but with the best pit stop time. Uh, and so the team there gets 2,000 euros to go and take to the nearest pub and to enjoy life. Uh, there's also champagne as well, but this, uh, it's always been a good introduction to the sprint races because the mechanics do work very hard, only two permitted to do the four-tyre change, and uh, so this does reward the efforts of the mechanics, and uh, the champagne is being sprayed as uh, in the cool-down room behind the podium, the drivers are ready. 
and very shortly they will be called forward onto the podium ready for the presentations to get underway so the top three crews overall as well as in silver cup pro-am and am all there and uh, drivers discussing the races i suspect hiroshi hamaguchi and jean-luc bobalik in whatever language they can communicate the japanese and the french driver will be discussing what happened at the last corner of the run to the line because it was a pretty ruthless move by hamaguchi but there was a class win at stake and he was going for it and an opportunity was presented jerome polycon there from aka asp talking to maro engel from black falcon but uh, the discussions go on about the race and some of the tactics no doubt the driving standards but a lot of teams with much work to do with less than a week before we get to the next race at Silverstone. Jérôme Policon himself, of course, uh, a very quick driver himself, came back to racing in Bahrain at the end of last year. Look at the highlights of the race, and it all kicked off early as far as Marcus Winkelhock was concerned. He ended up in the gravel, and as shards of carbon fibre threw everywhere, we also lost Tom Gamble with damage in the Audi. Then we had this spin as around went Phil Keane after a tag from Christian Engelhardt. The biggest incident of the lot, David Perrell shoveling Fred Vavish aside. Vavish had a big, big spin, came across the road, nailed Bertolini, off went Hauser, went Vanthor, went Brokers and others. And although we had the safety car deployed, the race back underway as we headed towards the pit window. And the Mercedes in the hands of initially Raffaele Marchiello, then Vincent Abril had that clutch problem as we heard and it fell away in the stint, eventually retiring. And it meant that after the pit stopped, Luca Stolz was the race leader in the Black Falcon uh, Mercedes AMG and there was seemingly no stopping him as the car continued to build a gap in the end 11.6 seconds over everybody else there was this tiny moment from Iro Vanio late race but we lost Abril and he was absolutely gutted he knew the car was on the way and it was getting slower and slower and then another of the Acker ASP cars hit problems as well Bogoslavski got smokier and smokier van der Linde and Collard decided to have an impromptu touring car battle and in the end Calvin van der Linde was introduced to Ricky Collard. He couldn't get past him. So a lap later, he tried it this way, and it worked. Threw on the inside line, and then we lost Bogostowski right at the very end with a smoky car. A win for Lukas Stoltz, Maro Engel, and Black Falcon here at Brands Hatch. So there are the drivers and uh, the podium ready to get underway. So Stein Scotthorst and Nick Foster will be out first for third spot. Stein Scotthorst and Nick Foster, first time on the podium, he says. So trying to look at where we go. There is a very happy pair of drivers for Arkin Arkas, a Tempto racing team that made its name really in the uh, German Carrera Cup, then Porsche Super Cup before coming into Montpan GT racing. For second place, Andrea Caldarelli and Marco Mappelli step forward. And then Sean Paul Breslin for Black Falcon will get onto the podium as well for the winning team. And then it is a race win for Mario Engel and Luca Stoltz, who step forward race winners here in race two of the Brockpan GT World Challenge Europe. Brands Hatch, the venue, and it is the German drivers that are victorious. So, for the winning drivers, then, the presentations are about to get underway. Mike Groves from Motorsport Vision steps forward with the trophies. And the Browns Hatch circuit manager heads first to Stein Scotthorst and Nick Foster. Then, for second place, Andrea Caldarelli and Marco Mappelli receive their trophies. Sean Breslin for the winning team, Black Falcon, which, of course, has been a major thorn in the side of ACA ASP. Uh, not just today, but in Blancpain events past, taking, especially in the endurance races, taking the team's trophy. And Maro Engel and Luca Stoltz win at Brands Hatch. And now the checks to the season-long entrance are presented by the governor, by Stefan Rattel, the founder of the CEO of SRO Motorsport Group. So 7,500 7 euros go to Attempto, 10,000 to the Orange 1 FFF racing team, and 12,500 euros to the Black Falcon squad for the efforts of Luca Stoltz and Maro Engel. And now, because they don't need to worry about another race, we can have the 
champagne to be sprayed, and it's Sean Breslin that cops for most of it, I'm afraid, from his two drivers, but he'll take that as uh, a very happy team owner. A great win, and well, it's a German team, Sean a Brit, to win at Brands Hatch means something pretty special as well. He gets his own back, although most of the champagne's gone in his eyes. But I don't think, looking at the site, the uh, lip reading, that he's overly pleased about it, but anyway, it's a win, and he's content with the results nonetheless. So, we've had a drama-filled weekend, that's for sure, in these opening races in the Blancpain GT World Challenge Europe. The Endurance Cup is in action next weekend at Silverstone with a three-hour race, and we'll see what that has in store. But here, it's been a day of Mercedes with honours in race one for Hacker ASP. And here in race two, Mario Engel, Lucas Stoltz and Black Falcon, the winners. From John Watson and David Addison, it's goodbye from Brands Hatch. So we have then the overall drivers making their way off the podium and the Silver Cup should be next. So up come Aravagno and Hugo de Sadelier for third place, there they are. Second place will be for the uh, combination of the Atepto drivers, Milan Doncha and Matteo Drudi, and then for the top step, once again, it will be Nico Vastiat and Thomas Neubauer as the Silver Cup winners in race one, and that means that Jerome Polycon comes out yet again to receive more silverware. And uh, the team patron onto the podium with uh, the uh, drivers for the top step set to come forward. Now where are they? Nico Vastiat and Thomas Neubauer venture forth. And they will be the national anthem of Aka ASP as the winning team. Not entirely sure that was the right anthem, but anyway, um, it's the right flag, I think, pr pretty much. Uh, but Jerome Polycon looking rather perplexed about all of that. And uh, the winners are, irrespective, Nico Bastien and Thomas Neubauer. But it is Aro Vigno and Hugo de Sadeli for our motorsport that get the trophy for third place. Then for second spot, Milan Doncha. Graduated from GT4, he was a race winner here with Nikolai Müller-Madsen in GT4 last year. And uh, his co-driver Mattia Drudi up from Italian Formula 4 single-seater racing. And then you have the top step for the uh, race winners. So uh, two from two in the Silver Cup for Nico Bastian and along with him uh, Thomas Neubauer. And the trophies go their way. Then you will also have, of course, Jerome Polycon there with the winner's trophy. And Stefan Rattel comes out to hand over the checks to the winning drivers and the podium is about to be given the soundtrack of a supporting catering race getting underway uh, Pirelli also offer the two sets of tyres to the Silver Cup winners so that goes the way of Nico Bastian and Thomas Neubauer at Aka ASP and the Pirelli cap is needed for Milan Doncha as the drivers are all there on the podium with the photographs to be taken. So there, the presentation's done. And now the champagne to be sprayed. So a very happy partnership with a really successful first weekend racing together, Thomas Neubauer and Nico Bastian taking another Silver Cup victory here. So with a load of champagne in his eyes, Thomas Neubauer will make his way off the podium. Nico Bastian grinning from ear to ear because despite the penalty, they still uh, prevailed. And the Aka ASP team, in fact, probably is relief as much as anything as he drenches Neubauer because out of the three key cars of the team, that was the only one that survived. The other two, of course, having mechanical dramas. So uh, not only did it get to the end, it got to the end as a class winning car as well. So the drivers then off the podium. The 
champagne and trophies being made ready. And there will be the Pro-Am, and I suspect Am winner as well, to go out next. So the drivers will be there. And we have for uh, third in Pro-Am, David Parrell and Renat Salikov. That's Florian Schultzer, who is the Am winner. And he will go out with Wolfgang Triller as the Am victors. There they are. They stand on the side of the podium. And then we need the three from Pro-Am. So David Perel and Renat Salikov take uh, third place. David Perel, of course, having got that drive through for the incident up at Hawthorns. So David Perel and Renat Salikov step forward for third place. Slightly rueful, David Perel, it must be said. Jean-Luc Bobelik and Jim Pla second, but it could have been different, like 26,000, so they've been ahead. The margin at the end, 25,000th between the two cars. And then it's a win for the Orange One FFF Racing Team. And that means that the Pro-Am class is won by Phil Keen and Hiroshi Hamaguchi. And the Japanese driver will come forward with the ever modest Brit. He just lets his driving do the talking. Phil Keen, who is one of the few drivers to star in both modern and historic GT cars. And he and Hiroshi Hamaguchi are victorious at Brands Hatch in Pro-Am. So the national anthem for the Orange One FFF racing team that you might remember from a few moments ago when it had a sort of dummy run at being played. But now the trophies are being presented. First of all, to the winning AMs of Florian Schultzer and Wolfgang Triller, and to the winning team, of course, HP Racing that runs that car. Then we will have to the uh, third place drivers in Pro Am. There is Renat Salikov, David Perel, the South African, standing alongside him. At the other end of the podium, Jean Luc Bobelik and Jim Pla, all smiles. Jean Luc Bobelik, who He's the ACA part of ACA, ACA ASP, big enthusiast, but uh, a bit instrumental in the success of the team. And there, the Orange One FFF racing team takes the Pro-Am trophy. Phil Keane and Hiroshi Hamaguchi racing at Brands for the first time, and successfully so, as the trophies are held aloft and the checks go as well from Stefan Rattel to those season-long entrants. And an excellent drive by Hamaguchi to take that class win. Great stuff here at Brands Hatch in the opening round of Block Pan GT World Challenge Europe as the Pro-Am drivers hold the trophies aloft. A Pro-Am win for Phil Keane and Hiroshi Hamaguchi. So the trophies are held aloft for the camera crews down below and the champagne about to be sprayed. And the drivers then have uh, certainly deserved that. Hamaguchi winning on the line stole the win. Great stuff. The next Blanc Pan GT World Challenge Europe event is going to be mid-June at Misano. More action to come from there. But for now, from Brands Hatch, we're John Watson and David Anderson and the team. Bye-bye.